Welcome with me, Dr. Robert Murray. Before we begin, Stopwatch. I am prepared to begin. Really dialogue. Um, I will actually not be dealing with the political sa uh, situation in Egypt or Saudi Arabia or anything of that nature. Instead, we're going to be dealing uh, with two very essential topics relating to the origins, the sources of the Quran, and of, of course, the religion of Islam, which comes out of the Quran. Since the focus of these debates is the religion of Islam, not the Bible or Christianity, but the religion of Islam, and neither one of us invented Islam, we ourselves are not the focus of these debates. Instead of attacking the motives and character of each other, which, be, which of course would be to commit the logical fallacy called ad hominem, instead we're going to focus on the material that each of us presents in order to demonstrate the propositions that are set forth during the debate. I assume Mr. Shabir will be responding to what I present in my presentation, and I, of course, will be focusing on what he presents during his. And I do appreciate the way the ad was put in the newspaper, that this is to be a friendly dialogue in which we deal with the differences because just as I do not expect to hear anything new from Mr. Uh, Ali, I am not giving anything new. I'm not the originator of any arguments. Uh, I am simply one who researches and studies and then reports in terms what I have found. The first issue can be framed in various ways, but it simply boils down to this. Can we explain Islam, and of course, hence the Quran, in terms of pre-Islamic earthly sources, or do we have to say that we are confronted with material that could have only been brought down from heaven and revealed by God? So that the issue has to do with whether or not the pillars, the main issues and doctrines we find in Islam, do these things come as a result of revelation, or can we simply explain them as stories and rites and rituals that were picked up from Jewish, Christian, and Arabian fables and tales and, and religious things uh, that were placed in the Quran. One paraphrase of the Quran from Surah 25 has the unbelievers, and I, you know, I must admit I do not believe in Islam, so I guess I'm an unbeliever, saying this in the seventh century contemporary with Muhammad, the Quran is nothing more than a lie that Muhammad has forged and others have helped him do it. It is nothing more than tales that came down from the ancients which he has written down in the Quran. These stories are told to him morning and evening. Another translation which would be helpful, uh, this is by Muhammad Pickthall. He puts it this way, those who disbelieve say, this is not but a lie that he hath invented, and other folk have helped him with it. And they have produced a slander and a lie. And they say, fables of men of old, which he hath written down, so they are dictated to him morn and evening. Here in Arbery's translation, he'd perhaps give a more a rigorous translation. The unbelievers say, this is not but a culminy he has forged, and other folk have helped him to it. So they committed wrong and falsehood. 
they say, fairy tales of the ancients that he has written down so that they are recited to him at the dawn and in the evening. Now, of course, this means that the first proposition that I'm setting forth is that Islam can be explained in terms of pagan, Christian, and Arabian pagan sources, Persian sources, things of that nature. There's nothing supernatural about the Quran. There's nothing supernatural about Islam. It is simply a rehashing of stories. Uh, they are retold, little changes here and there, and things of that nature. And this, of course, is one reason why people did not accept Muhammad as a prophet, as it is recorded, I think, accurately in the Quran. They objected, saying that these are just simply fairy tales, these are myths, these are legends, these are things which have been handed down from time immemorial. Now, the response is given in the Quran itself. It's given in two ways. As part of the statement in the middle when the unbelievers say something, there's a break in the quotation mark, and here, uh, as given in Arbery's, the comment is made uh, by whoever uh, was the author of the Quran, so they have committed wrong and falsehood. So when the unbelievers say the Quran is simply a rehashing of these old fairy tales and stories, the first response of the Quran is that this is false, this is not true. And the second response is given in verse 6. Here I will read, for example, uh, in Pickthal, and, um, and say unto them, O Muhammad, he who knoweth the secret of the heavens and the earth hath revealed it. Lo, he ever is forgiving merciful. So the response in the Quran itself is not one of agreeing with the unbelievers and saying, yeah, sure, it's full of mistake. Yeah, it has these fables and these old wise tales. Yeah, I agree. These are legends. These are myths. These are old Arabian tales. These are old Persian tales, old Christian fables. It's not one of agreement according to the surah. It's one of disagreement saying this is a falsehood. This is not a, an accurate accusation. And then secondly, it is emphasized that instead these things are to be viewed as being brought down, revealed, so that the case becomes very clear, at least to the Western mind, as one looks at the text, that there really is only one choice. The choice is simply whether or not revelations were made and they were brought down by him who know this, knows the secrets and the mysteries of heaven or whether or not these things were actually invented on earth from different sources. So I have four propositions. Number one, the Quran refers to people, places, things, and events which are nowhere explained or defined within the Quran itself such as the surah which describes the blind man who came to Muhammad. What was the name of this man? What was the occasion? Why did Muhammad turn away from him? Uh, what is the significance of this? Well, as you go to uh, Yusuf Ali or you go to any book that explains the history of the Quran, you will find out that the only way we know who this blind man, we can even know his name, is from pre-Islamic history and as it relates to the history concerning Muhammad himself. Secondly, these things were not explained, and you can mark true, you can put down Dr. Mori is true, this is for number one. Number two, they were not explained because it was assumed that everyone already knew of these things. I think that is simple and I simply say true. Some passages, as a matter of fact in the Quran, would be unintelligible without recourse to history. If you don't go to the Hadith, you don't go to the commentaries, you don't go to history, either pre-Islamic history or the times of Muhammad himself, you simply cannot understand various passages in the Quran. This is why all Islamic scholars, and I read all different kinds of books, be they um, Muslim or Christian or Jewish, they all have recourse to history to explain what we find in Islam and the Quran. 
what is the conclusion? It is perfectly legitimate and proper to use pre-Islamic history to explain the Quran and of course what ended up in the religion of Islam itself. Now this truth, for better or for worse, even though Surah 25 says that really the response is to say that this is a lie, you do have those Muslims who have been overwhelmed by Western scholarship and by the source materials and so they're in a difficult position of having to agree with the unbelievers and instead of saying it's not true that these were old tales instead they have to agree and say well the unbelievers were right these are legends Jewish legends Christian legends uh, Arab legends and some of them do accept this and then as they go through the Quran itself they end up explaining these things for example, you have the references to the companions of the cave, which was an old Christian fable, and you will find that Yusuf Ali in his footnote number 2337 explains that this was a very ancient legend. It has to do with several youths and their dog got sealed in the cave and went to sleep for 300 to 300 to 9, 309 years. And when the cave was reopened, they came out and all was alive and well. I call it the Rip Van Winkle story. And this story, you see, which found its way into the Quran in Surah 18, uh, this is pictured as something that actually happened when, of course, it is a Christian fable. The same thing with the Jewish fable. You find two references in the Quran to the ape men story where people were turned into monkeys. And this is point out, pointed out uh, by Yusuf Ali, footnote number 79 in Surah 2, that this was no doubt a Jewish legend that found its way into the Quran and hence part of Islam. The same thing with Arabian fables, the story of the she-camel. Some of you may remember uh, Sali was given a challenge and they said, well, take this huge rock and make it into um, a milch camel, a camel that's giving milk. And the rock groaned and out of the rock came this huge, gigantic camel. Well, the reference in the Quran to the she-camel would be unintelligible unless you go back to the Arabian tales. And this, of course, is what some, uh, even Muslim scholars, all the others do, but some Muslim scholars go back and point out that the story of the she-camel was simply uh, an Arabian tale that ended up in the Quran and part of the body of what is taught in Islam. Now, some will go along with that and will agree with the unbelievers and say, Dr. Mori, I agree with you. In this case, I say, fine, then I won the debate. But when we apply it to the central pillars of Islam, and we talk about the pilgrimage, we talk about uh, the fasting, and we talk about these things, then it gets a little dicey because you're getting to the very soul of Islam. And if the very soul, the very heart of Islam is not something revealed, but something that's simply revamped. It's like an old jalopy, a pagan jalopy that's been painted and now put up under another name. It, then it's, a, it's devastating. Several propositions. Number one, Mecca was a pre-Islamic pagan center of worship. And of course, I say true, it was. Secondly, the Kaaba, by, by the way, as reported, and I have the books here, there are no less than three Kaabas have been discovered. So you have three of them. But the one at Mecca, uh, we know in the other two, they were pagan temples. And the one at Mecca was filled with 360 idols. And that's according to the Hadith. Even when Muhammad instructed Muslims to pray toward it, uh, as Yusuf Ali in his footnote puts, even at that time uh, when the command was given to pray toward Mecca, uh, the enemies, the pagans were still in charge. Proposition number three. The pagans prayed by bowing down toward Mecca at least five times each day, corresponding to the five times that Muslims pray. They made a pilgrimage to Mecca. This is true. When they got there, they ran around the Kaaba seven times. They kissed and caressed the black stone. They sacrificed animals. They ran up and down two hills. They threw stones. All of these things were part of their pilgrimage, and this is true. They held their public meetings on Friday instead of like Jews on Saturday or Sunday like Christians. They fasted during the day for one month. True. They performed ritual washings before their prayers. 
The pagans even snorted water up and out their nose. True, the pagans in their religion gave alms to the poor. They cut off the hands of thieves. They forbade marrying sisters. They did not eat swine and many, many other things. All of these things are true of the pre-Islamic paganism that was dominant in Arabia. Now, there's two basic responses that I have received uh, from Muslims. Uh, one is a state of denial and to say that this is a lie. Uh, these things are not so. Uh, this is not true according to history. And then they will challenge the sources and, and it ends up everybody else is a liar as well. Or the really smart ones will say, well, I agree with you. They were before Muhammad, but actually it was Abraham who built the Kaaba, he established the pilgrimage, the running around it seven times, kissing the black stone. A matter of fact, they even have a stone that he stood on like a flying carpet that lifted him up so he could put the big stones up. And Ishmael helped him do it. So you have this myth uh, that Ishmael is the father of the Arabs and that they are his descendants and that Abraham and Ishmael lived in Mecca and they did all of these things. And of course, this not only contradicts uh, the Bible, the Torah. It also contradicts uh, secular history. And what we do to respond to this is simply point out there is no proof that has ever been set forth to demonstrate that Abraham and Ishmael ever lived in Mecca. I would love to see the Muslims allow a team of archaeologists into Mecca to take samples of the stones of the Kaaba to see indeed if, as some state, the Kaaba was uh, built by Adam, others say by Abraham. Well, we'd like to see how old that building is and whether or not it was built by the pagans. According to the best of the history that we have, it was built by Muhammad's great-grandfather, Kosia. And as a matter of fact, in terms of whether Ishmael had anything to do with the Arab race, one Arab writer who wrote an entire book against me, and he was certainly zealous to find every error he could. When he gets to my section on Ishmael, he says, in my research on this topic, I found a few interesting comments about Abraham, Ishmael, and the Arabs. In pre-Islamic times, Ishmael was never mentioned as the father of the Arabs. And of course, other books do state this. You see, Abraham was the father of the Jews, not the Arabs. The mother of Ishmael, Hagar, was an Egyptian. Thus, she was not an Arab. They never lived in Arabia. The Arabs were already there. They had built many cities, and they continued to live after him. Thus, the, the whole idea that uh, these pagan rituals and rites and these things really didn't come from the pagans. The pagans had stolen them from the religion of Abraham. That itself is a myth and a legend. And I would challenge uh, any Muslim uh, who would want to, to attempt to prove, not just to assert it and then go on, they have to prove by some kind of pre-Islamic evidence that uh, Abraham was the one uh, who built it, who ran it, and Ishmael's the father, the Arabs, and things of that nature. Thus, as I look at it, I have to agree with the unbelievers in the seventh century who said, there's nothing new here, folks. The Quran is a fraud. It's filled with religious rituals and fairy tales and legends, people becoming monkeys, sun setting in the muddy pond, she camels, uh, all sorts of weird things. And these have all been discovered. There's, there's nothing in there. Why would God bother to reveal this garbage all over again? It doesn't work so that many of the beliefs and rituals found in the Quran came from pre-Islamic pagan sources. Four of the five pillars of Islam were pagan rituals. Two minutes. The Quran, and consequently the religion of Islam, was not revealed from heaven but compiled from contemporary sources on earth. It is a combination of distorted stories from the Bible and stories taken from false and pagan religions. I do put forth then 25 propositions. I will be very interested uh, to see these propositions will now be given out to all of you. These are all yes or no. These are in logic questions of fact, whether or not the Quran refers to things which are not explained, whether or not 
we have to go to the pre-Islamic sources in order to explain Islam. These propositions either make or break the claim of Islam that it has a supernatural revelation. If everything about it can be explained with no recourse to inspiration, and it is filled with l legends and myths, then these propositions reveal that Islam is not the religion of God, Muhammad was not his prophet, and indeed the Quran is not the word of God. I do thank you, and I do bear witness that there is but one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and Jesus is the only crucified Son of God, and the Bible is the only word of God for a lost and erring mankind. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Murray. And now, Mr. Shabir Ali for 10 minutes of rebuttal. We have just heard from uh, Dr. Robert Murray a number of propositions from which he bases a certain conclusion. Dr. Mori, I'd like to congratulate you that much of the evidence you have presented here this evening is actually true. But Dr. Mori, you have not won the debate because you have committed a fallacy in argument known as non sequitur, does not follow. Your conclusion does not follow from the evidence. Proving, ladies and gentlemen, that certain things in Islam existed also before Islam does not prove that Islam is false. There is one God in Islam. If you prove that there was one God existing before Islam, that does not prove that Islam is false. If you want to establish from that that this should mean that it is possible now to presume that the Prophet Muhammad and whom be peace possibly took all these items from pre-Islamic Arabia use them as building blocks in which to construct a false religion called Islam, well then what you have established with all of these points is a possibility that it is possible that Muhammad may have done it. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to argue not with the individual points that Mori has brought for forward to us today, but I would like to take a different route and show you that it was impossible for Muhammad and whom be peace to have constructed or authored the Quran. And logically, you have to understand the logical force between possible and impossible. Usually we take these two words to mean the opposite of each other, but logically, impossible always wins out over possible. Let me explain. If we can establish that a certain person was on, on the scene of a crime, he might be arrested and suspected of being the criminal. That means it's possible that he may have committed that crime. But when he is brought for trial, if his lawyer can prove that it was impossible for him to have committed that crime, then the man goes free. The case is proven and the impossible wins out. For example, if the crime was a shooting uh, killing, and if it can be established that this person who was there on the scene, and it was possible for him to have committed that crime, if it can be proven that he has no fingers, well then, the impossible wins out. It is impossible that this man could have been the criminal and he goes free. Ladies and gentlemen, it is impossible for the Prophet Muhammad on whom be peace to have constructed the Quran. We find not only the evidence that Dr. Mori presented here tonight, but much more convincing evidence in the Quran to show that this book could not have been authored by any human being. We have seen in the Quran again and again that the Quran speaks about the past and then independent research confirms that the Quran is absolutely true. Then we find that the Qur'an speaks about the future, and the future unfolds exactly the way the Qur'an said it would. That could not be authored by a human being. Let me give you an example. We have in the Qur'an, for example, the story about the drowning of the Pharaoh. Now someone may say, oh, hell, that story existed before. The Prophet Muhammad, all he had to do was go copy out of the, out of the Bible, right? Wrong. Because the Bible indicates that the Pharaoh, uh, Pharaoh and his army drowned, and the indication we get there is that they just simply perished in the sea. Nothing further said about them. However, the Quran in Surah 10, ayah number 92, dares to predict 
that the body of the Pharaoh has been saved, has been preserved, and will become a sign for people who will come later. And ladies and gentlemen, the body of the Pharaoh was discovered by Lorette in 1898 and documented by Sir Elliot Smith in this book, The Royal Mummies. Dr. Maurice Bouquet, a scientist, had the opportunity to uh, do some investigations on this body, which is now in the museum in Cairo, and he found that this is exactly the same pharaoh that was destroyed, that was buried in that sea. And the question now remains, how did the Prophet Muhammad, on whom be peace, come by this information? Not only that the body of the pharaoh was preserved, but also that this body will be discovered later on to become a sign for the later people. Past history, and it's accurate, the future predicts 100%. That's not authored by Muhammad, it was impossible. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, many of the things that the Quran says reveals that the author had knowledge which was not available to any human being until our most recent centuries. Some of the scientists uh, in conducting investigations on the Quran, they have found, for example, Dr. Keith Moore, of the University of Toronto, the chairman of the Department of Embryology there, until his retirement some years ago, Dr. Moore found that there are certain things which the Quran says that could not have been discovered by any human being prior to the invention of the microscope. Only after the microscope could the growth and development of human babies be studied in the very early stages. Yet the Quran comments upon these early stages and reveals that the author knows things that scientists will discover many centuries later. For example, after reading some of the Quranic statements, Dr. Moore comments and he says, I was amazed, <coughs> I'll take some water. He says, at the accuracy, not the accuracy, at the scientific accuracy of these statements which were made in the 7th century AD. Furthermore, Dr. Moore looks at the statement in the Quran that human beings are created in stages in the wombs of their mothers and he says, quote, the realization that the embryo develops in stages in the uterus was not discussed or illustrated until the 15th century AD. The staging of human embryos was not proposed until the 1940s, and the stages used nowadays were not adopted worldwide until a few years ago. Yes, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, Dr. Mori. There were certain things which were there in Arabia before Islam, and they're also in Islam, because those are good things. And when God sends a prophet to a people, he does not declare that all the good things that you knew about are all false. The prophet speaks like Jesus. You knew that such and such a thing was good, but I declare to you this. You have heard that you should not commit adultery, but I say to you, whoever looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in her heart. It's not saying cancel everything you knew already, but the things which you know to be good, those are preserved by God. If God sends a prophet today, he will not, but suppose he does. Most people realize that incest is wrong. Would the prophet of God say to people, oh, no, incest is right now because, see, I'm a new prophet of God, I have to be different. No. The prophet will confirm the same things which you know previously to be good and which are, in fact, good, and he will show you how to go about living according to those principles. Furthermore, more new things in the Quran. Dr. Moore looked at Surah 23 in the Quran, ayahs number 12 to 16, and he says concerning the description there about the difference between the development of two stages of the human embryo. And he says, and I quote him, the agreement between the lag or gap in development mentioned in the Quran and the slow rate of change during the second and third weeks is amazing. These details of human development were not described until about 40 years ago. Unquote from Dr. Keith Moore. Ladies and gentlemen, it was impossible for the Prophet Muhammad on whom be peace to have authored this book. Yes, Dr. Mori, there were certain things which were there and also there in the Quran, but there were also things which were not there and not available to the Prophet Muhammad on whom be peace or any of his contemporaries, and you did not bring this out, but I will help you. In Surah 11, in ayah number 49, God says to Muhammad that these are new information that we give you from the unseen. Neither you nor your contemporaries knew this before this book was revealed to you. And none of his contemporaries could have challenged him on that and say, no, oh, wait a minute, we knew that thing, and how come you're now saying you got it from God? No. When that declaration came, it won the day. Surely they said at other times, yeah, ancient tales and so on, but 
when it comes to the challenge from God, can you come forward and say that, yes, we knew this item of knowledge before, and what is your proof? Nobody could come forward with that. And the challenge of God in the Quran remains true. Dr. Mori mentioned Surah 25. But Dr. Mori... Two minutes. Unfortunately, you did not translate this verse correctly, and I don't blame you because you were reading from reputable translations. However, the unbelievers did not say that Muhammad wrote the book, but they said that Muhammad and whom be peace caused it to be written because they were aware that Muhammad did not have the ability to write. So they say, Asatiru al-awwalina iktatabaha, that he caused it to be written, not that he wrote it himself, fahiya tumla alayhi bukratan wa asila. And then he has it read to him day and night. See, they knew that Muhammad did not read or write, so they said he caused the book to be written and he had others to read it for him. But I don't blame you because you were reading from reputable translations. However, uh, what about the response of people who saw that the Qur'an was really from God? You said that the unbelievers all rejected the Qur'an. What about Omar? When he heard the Qur'an being read, he responded with tears and embraced Islam. What about Tufail al-Dawsi who had put cotton in his ear so he wouldn't hear the Qur'an being read? And then when he did finally hear the Qur'an being read, tears came to his eyes, he embraced Islam, went back to his tribe and converted his tribe to Islam. What about these people? Ladies and gentlemen, I put before you again and again that Time these points prove that the Qur'an could not have been written by the Prophet Muhammad on whom be peace. I thank you very much for your patient listening. I can loosen my tongue that they may understand my speech. Praise be to Allah, Lord of the worlds. Peace and blessings be upon his noble messenger. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Mori thinks he can prove that Islam was not revealed by God if he can find that Islam says the same things which were already said before Islam. He does not realize that if he applies the same method to the Bible, he would join the rank of those who no longer believe in the Bible. He was right in saying that well, this debate is not about the Bible, but this debate can also be about a method to establish a certain truth, and I'd like to show you that that method does not work. One such man who used this method was Magnus Magnusson, author of the book Archaeology of the Bible. Everything I've say, I'm going to say to you today, I have the documents here to prove them. On page 21 he writes, The Sumerians recorded the oldest myths known to us, stories about the creation that would be echoed many centuries later in the creation myths of Genesis. But the most astonishing parallel between the Sumerian myths and the biblical myths is the story of the flood, according to Archaeology of the Bible, page 21. Then about the flood itself, this man writes, The story he told is so close in its details to the biblical flood story that that the biblical flood story was obviously borrowed directly from the much earlier Sumerian original. Archaeology of the Bible, page 21. Then about the Ten Commandments, he writes that for a long time it was believed that the Ten Commandments was the first of its kind. But recent archaeological discoveries have shown that many law codes from centuries earlier contain many of the ideas now in the Bible. Archaeology of the Bible, page 68. Similarly, the book, The Bible is History, I have this book also here with me, you can examine it in the, during the break. This book, The Bible is History, says it was certainly possible to be quite convinced that the God-given moral law of Israel was without precedent in the ancient East until parallels became known. The Bible is History, page 134. After discussing those parallels, that book says, the consequence of this renders it difficult for us today to maintain the earlier claim that the biblical code of laws was unique. This fact may well shake the confidence of many people. We cannot remove this feeling of uncertainty. The Bible as History, page 137. Muslims and Christians will no doubt reject the conclusions of these men. We believe that the creation and the flood are not ancient myths, but God-given truths. However, ladies and gentlemen, Muslims and Christians will agree that just because a certain truth was known before the Bible or known before the Quran, that does not mean that God did not reveal it to a certain prophet like Moses or to Jesus. We will not agree with these men in saying that the commandments which God, Moses gave to his followers, that these commandments Moses somehow borrowed it from the law of Hammurabi or that the flood story in Genesis is a myth that was copied from the ancient Babylonian flood myth, the Epic of Gilgamesh, or that the creation story was one of the Babylonian creation myths, as Isaac Asimov has already said. What surprises me, however, is that some Christians feel that they can attack the Quran in this particular way, 
and they don't realize that they're shooting themselves in the foot when they use this method. Because the same method disproves also the Quran. However, Dr. Mori, you have an interesting way of going about this. Because when Dr. Mori uses this particular method, Dr. Mori says that he's a Western scholar. But he forgets for the moment that he's also a Christian. Does he wear two hats, once as a Western scholar and then as a Christian? I would like Dr. Mori to wear one hat so we can pin him down and say, this is what you should believe in. If you say that this is your method, then believe neither in the Quran nor the Bible. We have already seen, too, that Dr. Mori uh, disparages the miracles. For example, camel coming out of a rock. No, that's foolish. But do we disparage the miracles that are mentioned in the Bible, too? If we believe that miracles are true, then we should uh, find some different way, other way of denying that a certain miracle took place or not. Not that we disparage a miracle. So we have to make up our minds. If we are believers in God, then we cannot deny that these things are true. And we cannot use that particular method by which the Western scholars disbelieve in both the Quran and the Bible. Now, let me remind Dr. Mori of the following scripture. How can you say to your brother, let me remove that splinter from your eye, when the wooden beam is in your own eye? You hypocrite. Remove the wooden beam from your eye first. Matthew chapter 7, verses 4 to 5. And in case Dr. Mori thinks I should not discuss the Bible here, let me remind him of this scripture. For as you judge, so will you be judged. Matthew chapter 7, verse 2. Consider below how Dr. Mori judges Islam when he writes, quote, Muhammad did not preach anything new, everything he taught, and so on and so forth, as we've already heard. The first problem with this approach is that it can be applied against Jesus with greater force. Ladies and gentlemen, everything Jesus taught can be traced back to the Old Testament. Hugh Sconfield, in his book, The Passover Fl Plot, I have this too, has even postulated that Jesus read the Old Testament about a Messiah who was to suffer and then convinced himself that he was to be that suffering Messiah. So, he went up to Jerusalem deri deliberately provoking the Jews to put him to death. He also had a secret plot with his disciples to drug him so that he would appear dead and then they would help him to revive later. You see the problem with this kind of an approach. It cuts both ways. If atheists want to discount the Prophet Muhammad and Umbi peace, they can use this approach to their satisfaction because they, for them, revelation does not happen. There are no such things as prophets of God because there's no God in the first place. However, when Christians use this approach, it must be seen as a misguided attempt to discount Muhammad and whom be peace. A second problem with Mori's assumption, a presumption that a prophet is disproved is his presumption that the prophet is disproved if we find him repeating ancient te teaching. And he gives an example of this. He said even the idea of only one God was borrowed from Jews and Christians in his invasion book, page 157. Does Mori imagine that for the prophet Muhammad on whom be peace to be true, he has to preach two gods for a change? No, of course he's going to preach the one God. I find it very strange that this should be used as a proof against the prophet. Then Dr. Mori sometimes attacked the Quran for things that he imagined in, in the Quran. He imagines that something is there in Islam. He finds the same thing outside of Islam. He says, see, again we've proven it. Islam is just like what was there before. He says, for example, in, an in his invasion book, page 150, the seven heavens and hells described in the Quran. Islamic invasion, page 150. Yet there is no such verse in the Quran which says seven heavens and hells. Similarly, Dr. Mori had imagined a historical confusion in the Quran when he noticed that in Surah 7, verse 64, the flood of Noah is mentioned, and then in verse number 136, the drowning of the Pharaoh is mentioned. So Mori then accused the Quran of claiming that the flood of Noah occurred in the days of Moses. He was then delighted to say in, about this imagined error in, in the Quran, he said, this error cannot be easily swept aside. <laughs> Invasion book, page 141. On the contrary, the imagined error washes away when we read the surah. Had Mori read the surah, he would have noticed that the Quran concludes the description of the flood of Noah in verse 64, and then the story about the Pharaoh, or about Moses, does not start until verse number 103. And the 80 and, or the some 30 or some verses that are there in between, these verses talk about many other communities, many other times and places, before finally getting to Moses. I wonder how Dr. Mori uh, made this sort of confusion. Dr. Mori, can you tell us whether you did in fact read that surah, surah 7 in the Quran? If you did not, then why not? And if you did, then how did you make such a blatant mistake? 
Yet Dr. Mori needs not only to read, but also to read carefully. Mori quoted a hadith from the book Sahih al-Bukhari, volume 1, number 367, to say that Anas saw the whiteness of the penis of Allah's Prophet, according to his invasion book, page 182. Yet the hadith says not penis, but thigh. That hadith mentions thigh three times, and penis not even once. The caption of that hadith also said, what is said about the thigh? I wonder how did uh, Mori make this kind of confusion between thigh and penis? And I've checked many uh, prints and editions of this book, Sahih al-Bukhari, the one that he particularly quoted from, many others, I've checked the Arabic and the English, all of them, all of them say thigh, 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 or fakhiz, 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 never penis. Dr. Mori had called the Quran a fraud just a few minutes ago. Dr. Mori, I wonder if, these, uh, if this title should actually revert to you. Dr. Mori actually said that the Ishmael w was not the ancestor of the Arab race. And in fact, he has tried in this book to establish that by quoting from a certain McClintock and Strong, he calls it a well-known encyclopedia of religion, whereas in fact it is a biblical encyclopedia, and Dr. Mori uh, does not want his readers to know that. Furthermore, Dr. Mori misquoted or misused this quotation because this quotation does not deny that Arabs of both regions were the descendants of Ishmael. It mentions two regions. It says that one of these regions could not have descended from Ishmael. It does not, at least in what is quoted here, we don't know what is left out, at least from what is quoted here does not declare, deny the other region being the descendants of Ishmael. Dr. Mori, I think you have to use your quotations more carefully, but more of that will follow. Now. Dr. Mori also uh, commented and said that there's a problem in the Qur'an because the, pro the Qur'an mentions things which were there before, as we said, but he mentions two such things which are not in the Qur'an. For example, he said, Azazil and other spirits coming up from Hades. And two, the peacock story. Dr. Mori, will you tell our listeners where you found these things in the Qur'an exactly? Uh, but I will help Dr. Mori with the first one. This thing about Azazil is not in the Quran, but in the Bible. Don't bother looking. <laughs> in the Bible, in the book of Leviticus, chapter 16, I will ask everyone to try practice restraint. I'm the only one that's allowed to blow my top here today. <laughs> in Leviticus, chapter 16, verse 8, uh, it is, God says that Aaron should take two goats, and he shall cast lots to determine which one is for the Lord and which one is for Azazil. And then he should sacrifice the one which is for the Lord, but the other one is for Azazil. What should Aaron do with that one? He should set that one before the Lord, and then the Lord will send that off to Azazil. So who is this Azazil? The New American Bible, and I have this here too, St. Joseph Medium Size Edition, says in a footnote, Azazil, perhaps a name of Satan. New American Bible, page 117. So Dr. Mori, will you tell us then, what is the problem exactly you have with Azazil, as you've stated in your invasion book? And... Since the problem you hoped was in the Qur'an is not actually in the Qur'an but in the Bible, what are you going to do about it now? <laughs> the scientist Isaac Asimov links the mention of Azazil above with the story of Genesis chapter 6 verse 1 to 4. About this passage in Genesis, Asimov writes, This remnant of primitive mythology lingering on in the Bible was interpreted literally by later Jews. They thought the angels deliberately rebelling against God chose to corrupt themselves with mankind out of the lust for women and that this act helped bring on the flood. Some versions of this legend made Azazil the chief of these angels. Asimov's Guide to the Bible, Volume 1, page 159. Dr. Mori, what led you to believe that this story was actually in the Qur'an? So eager was Dr. Mori to prove that everything in Islam existed also before Islam, that he simply imagined that interest was already condemned before Islam. And so he says this in his Invasion book, page 156. And because the Bible allows you to charge interest to a stranger but not to a brother, Israelite, Mori imagined that the same thing was in Islam also when he said this in his invasion book, page 156. Where exactly in the Quran did you find this, Dr. Mori, or in the Hadith anywhere? Where is your evidence for this claim? So, ladies and gentlemen, we can show again and again that although there might have been some things that existed before Islam and are all, all uh, again in Islam, that does not prove that the Prophet Muhammad, on whom be peace, used those things in Islam. Otherwise, you would have to give the Prophet Muhammad, on whom be peace, too much credit. You'd have to imagine him as a scholar of the highest rank. Because if you see what was there before and what's actually now in Islam, you'll find amazing differences. Let's see. 
If you take a neutral position and examine the matter carefully, you would see, for example, a man like Reverend Tisdall, Sinclair Tisdall, from whom Dr. Mori has copied many mistakes. He wrote a book called Sources of The Source of Islam, in which he said, throughout the Quran, only one verse is quoted from the Gospel. Uh, Tisdall, Sources of Islam, The Source of Islam, page 72. However, this Christian missionary did make a mistake, for which I apologize. He says that, the, the quotation is referring to Surah 7, ayah number 38, which says that certain persons will not enter paradise until the camel goes through the eye of the needle. So you compare that with what is in the Gospels. But ladies and gentlemen, apart from the phrase through the eye of the needle, which simply means impossible, the teaching of the two books are different. According to the Bible, a rich man cannot go into heaven no matter what. According to the Quran, the one who cannot, who cannot go into heaven is the one who rejects the signs of God, the message from God, and is rebellious towards the message of God. Now the benefit of this difference is clear when you realize that according to the Bible pronouncement, a Christian must sell everything he has and give to the poor or to the church, according to Acts chapter 4 verse 32 and chapter 5 verses 1 to 5. Now I know that Christians don't practice this, which means that Christians are closer to the Quran in this respect than they are to the Bible. Number two, uh, Tisdal, from what he said above, was unaware he was unaware that other things in the Quran was also similar to the Bible because he said the Quran quoted only once. Apart from his mistake that the Quran did not quote, he said only once, and that's also not true. Because there are many th other things in the Quran which are similar to the Bible. But perhaps Tisdal was not aware, or perhaps he did not dare compare. Perhaps he did not dare compare. Because he did quote from the Quran where the Quran mentions the story about the Annunciation when the angel came to Mary to tell her that she will have a son. However, when Mary asked, how can I have a son when no man has touched me? According to the Quran, the answer she got was, so it will be, for Allah creates what he wills. When he has decreed something, he says to it only be, and it is. The Quran Surah 347. Now, according to the Bible, the answer is different. And you must wonder, how come Muhammad did not copy that answer from the Bible? Listen to the answer. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Luke chapter 1 verse 35. The benefit of the Quranic expression can be clear when you realize that many of the lay people make a confusion when they read the Gospel of Luke here. They imagine that God replaced the male element in the birth of Jesus. And then they have a further confusion as to who exactly is the father of Jesus. Is it the Holy Spirit that came upon Mary and fathered Jesus? Or is it the Father in heaven? who is the father of Jesus. But I cannot help you with this sort of confusion, ladies and gentlemen, except to invite you to the truth that God has revealed to correct all of this confusion. Ladies and gentlemen, I notice this confusion here today as well, when during the prayers we noticed that some people were praying to Yahweh and some were saying, yes, Jesus, praise be to Jesus. Because Yahweh and Jesus, according even to the Trinity, are two different persons, they're not one and the same. If you say that Yahweh is Jesus, then how can you say that Yahweh sent his son? Then who is his son? Not Jesus? But that is off topic and I apologize for that. Ladies and gentlemen, more to the topic. More to the topic, Mori claimed that the Quran is wrong in saying that Aziz was the name of the man who, brought, who bought Joseph, the son of Jacob. How does he know this? Does he have some record that shows that Aziz was not the one? Or are you just saying that, you know, no, because according to the Bible it was Potiphar and the Bible is always right, according to Mori, uh, Invasion, page 140. Apart from Mori's confusion here between a name and a title, if Mori had compared the story of Joseph in the Bible and the Quran, he would have found amazing differences there. For example, to whom did the Midianites sell Joseph? According to the Bible, we have two different answers. One, to the Israelites, and two, to Potiphar, the officer of Pharaoh. Both according to Genesis chapter 37. Two answers. Who brought Joseph to Egypt? Three different answers from the Bible. One answer, the Ishmaelites. Two an second answer, the Midianites. Third answer, Joseph's brothers. Compare Genesis chapter 37 with Genesis chapter 42. Two minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, if the Prophet Muhammad, on whom be peace, was copying was copying from the previous revelations. How then? How then did he so carefully avoid the mistakes which were there in the Bible? How then did he avoid mistakes which Mori could not avoid in his own book? 
How did he avoid mistakes which I cannot avoid in my own writings? As a human being, I know that very well. How did he avoid such mistakes? Ladies and gentlemen, he was not copying from the previous sources. Allah was revealing to him the true record of what went, back, what went past. Let me give you an example very quickly. Everybody knows that God doesn't rest. Muslims believe that, Christians believe that. Yet the Bible says that after God created the heavens and the earth in six days, on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. Exodus chapter 31 verse 17. Do Christians believe that, that God rested and he was refreshed? Yet the Quran in Surah 50, ayah number 38 says that God created the heavens and the earth in six days and whatever was between them and nothing of weariness even touched us. Nothing of weariness touched us. You see, the Quran is not just copying the Bible, but it's correcting the Bible. The Quran is not copying what went before it, but copying. But the Quran is correcting. Be patient. Mori called the Quran a fraud. And he called the Quran garbage. Let's be quiet. All right? I have not called the Bible any such thing. The Bible I respect. It contains many truths from God. But I'm saying that it also has some things which human beings have put into it. These things you cannot blame on God. These mistakes are not God's mistakes, but human mistakes. And I'm responding to what Mori has said by showing that the Quran could not have been copied either from the Bible or any other sources. I've used the Bible as an example to show you because you can compare that easily. If I talk about the Code of Hammurabi or some other ancient source, then it's all obscure and might be confusing to you, but I'm giving you what you can deal with. So ladies and gentlemen, we must conclude that the Quran, although it had some things, it has some things which are similar to what went before it, but some things are also new, different, some things are also correcting the previous records, and some things reveal matters that will be discovered as items of knowledge by scientists working many centuries later by the most updated and sophisticated equipment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ali. Thank you. Either side to take any part such as this. Yes. Please remain quiet. Those who are unable to leave, please leave. Otherwise, you have to keep the peace here. Okay. Part of the peace is to stay quiet. Addition. It has to do with do some of the major beliefs and rituals of the Quran and Islam, such as the pillars of Islam, come from pre Islamic sources. Or were they revealed? This is what is stated in the newspaper. This is the proposition that both Mr. Ali and I signed. Does the proposition say to debate Bob Morey, his character, his book, his grandmother, or his dog? No. Mr. Ali has written many things. I have some of your books. Great blasphemies against Christianity, the Holy Trinity, Jesus, many terrible things he's written. Now, I did not bring any of those things up because we are supposed to be limited in a debate to what the material is presented during the debate. In good faith, I have presented material about pre-Islamic sources of the Quran and of Islam. Instead, he does what is called in logic the red herring approach. In other words, when the topic is too hot to handle, change the subject. Discuss anything from Bear to Bathsheba that has no relevance whatsoever to the issues that are being debated. If you look carefully, I am not the center of the proposition. Neither is Mr. Ali. What you must understand is that his discussion of the Trinity, the deity of Christ, the Bible. He, he must have, I listed about 20 different topics that have nothing to do with pre-Islamic uh, sources of the Quran and of Islam, which means argumentum uh, alinche, they're totally irrelevant, having to do with anything, and I'll basically ignore them because they're irrelevant. Now, I must point out that the Quran in Surah 25, 4 through 5, the unbelievers say that what is found in the Quran is nothing but a bunch of stories that have been copied down, and that's where they come from. The response that Mr. Ali is supposed to give is also recorded. Here's the response. In truth, it is they who have put forward an iniquity and a falsehood 
The Quran was sent down by him who knows the mystery that is in the heavens. I do not think there is a passage in the Quran where Muhammad or whoever wrote this agrees with the unbelievers and gives in and said, yes, these are stories. That's a question of fact. He doesn't want to say that it destroys Islam, but if you study the passage very carefully, the response to the accusation is not his response saying, yeah, there's stories, let's go on and discuss the Trinity, much like a Jehovah's Witness will never keep to whatever topic it is, or they just change the topic. Here it is given that the Quran's response is that this accusation is false. He has now agreed with me over against the Quran, and he agrees with the unbelievers against what the Quran says. And I, and I do want to say I do appreciate the fact that at least that part of the debate, I have one. Now, that's because Western scholarship has nailed this to the floor. A few comments on just a few of the things. In my copy of the Hadith, since he has a penis fixation, I don't know what it is, it does say that Anas saw the sheet of Muhammad move and he saw the thigh of Muhammad and the whiteness of the thing. T-H-I-N-G of Muhammad. That is what it said. I asked a gentleman to check the Arabic of Bukhari. You have done so. What does it say? Not the thigh. The thing. So if I wrote a letter and said I saw the blackness of Shabir's thing, would anybody, just to be, would, would anybody have any question as to what's going on? Now, if Muhammad Khan deceived me by giving a wrong translation... Dr. Murray, I would suggest we stay on the topic, yes. please. Okay, well, the topic was the accusation that the Hadith does not refer to the thing, but to the thigh. And I believe I have answered that fully. Lastly, just to some comments in terms of logic. Uh, there are several fallacies which are operating beside the red herring approach which change the subject and irrelevant issues. You also have the fallacy of equivocation. The Islamic concept of inspiration is not the same as the Christian concept of inspiration. Biblical scholars have no problem saying that the word covenant was not invented when it was revealed to Abraham. It was a Susanry covenant, and we interpret the Bible in the light of its historical and cultural context. We don't believe the Bible was dropped down complete or written somehow on a tablet. Men of God spoke in the context and culture, so to us, pre-biblical sources are no threat because God is sovereign and he would guide the culture to be prepared for whatever he reveals. So y you've done a fallacy of equivocation by bringing the Bible in saying, well, look, if the Quran is to be thrown out, then we, we have to throw the Bible out too. If I were an atheist, I could say, well, in that case, then they all go. Another point, another uh, non sequitur, which again is a point of, of being irrelevant and trying to prove that the Quran is inspired, he pointed to the fact that it is historically accurate at times. Of course, it is notoriously histor uh, historically inaccurate, such as the Samaritan, such as with Alexander the Great, and many other situations. But you must remember this. Just because a book gives you an item of history that is accurate does not prove that that book is inspired, or every history book on every shelf would be the Word of God. His proofs and demonstrations scientifically, again, were non sequitur. You can have a book which speaks of many things. And of course, when I think of the Quran and it says that uh, we come uh, from frozen blood which comes from the back, and I don't think that the seed of man is frozen blood, and I think it comes from the loins, not the back. So there are many scientific problems from the sun going into the muddy pond, uh, but these are irrelevant to the issue of simply this, and we have the propositions. Again, Surah 25, the challenge is made, the Quran answers by denying that these are 
tales from the ancients and instead saying that they came down. If Shabir, under the weight of Western scholarship, is willing to join the unbelievers and admit, yes, the unbelievers' accusation was true, these were tales from the ancients, then I would say that the first part of the debate is done. I find nothing in the Quran to indicate it is nothing more than a garbled version of all kinds of tales that someone who was illiterate, and Muhammad was illiterate, uh, he did send a letter so he could scribble something. He was illiterate and he got it all garbled. As uh, Karen Armstrong in her biography of Muhammad stated that he had the chronology all wrong, he even thought the Two mother minutes. of Jesus was the sister of Moses and of Aaron. Thank you very much. You have two more minutes. Oh, I have two more minutes. Whoa, wait a second. Hold on, hold on. Now, um, let me just state this to the side. Um, in academic debates, and this is not a university setting, they are strictly regulated as to the material that is given. I am sorry that I even departed from the 25 propositions which have been laid out because these propositions relating to the fact that virtually everything in Islam, why they meet on Friday, why they snort water up and out of their nose, why they pray toward Mecca, how many times they pray, why they take a pilgrimage, why they fast, all of this stuff is pure paganism. This is why he's discussing me, my grandmother, the dogs, the trinity, uh, palm trees, Miami, or cruises. Anything but these propositions. Once you admit that 99% of the religion of Islam is warmed over paganism, the gig is up, folks. It's not the religion of God. You might as well as say, well, we can just take the paganism plus Muhammad, and that's Islam. So these 25 propositions will tell the tale. They are statements of fact. And I challenge any Muslim who is here, look at these propositions and you answer them. This I could call the Muslim IQ test. Find out historically whether or not these things are true, then you draw your own conclusion. My conclusion is that Islam is nothing more than the pagan religion in which Muhammad was raised, in which he divorced his pagan god Allah from his wife and his kids, and it still remains a pagan religion to the end. This, I feel, is based on the evidence of the pre-Islamic sources. I believe the arguments stand, and the fact that he has basically given the argument to me and has admitted that this is true, I take great comfort. Not only, and I wrote it down, did you say that it is possible that Muhammad could have invented this? It's not only possible, it's actual. He did. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Murray. Exactly in 15 minutes from now, washroom and, fo and water fountains are to your left as you leave the room. Thank you all. I really appreciate the order in which we conducted ourselves so far. It was made known to me by Mr. Ali that what had taken place was what they call takbir in the Islam religion. I'm not really privy to the details of the Islam religion, and uh, I can profess before you that I have known that. However, my duty out here is to be fair to both sides, irrespective of my own beliefs. So we have agreed as moderators, myself and my associate, that we will allow one takbir, meaning takbir Allahu Akbar, one time. And we will allow hallelujah one time on the other side. And please, without shouting, with all due respects to our own gods. All right, I thank you, and we will resume. Topic number two is going to be, is the God of Islam a true or a false God? It is going to go in the same series at time-wise, 20 minutes. Uh, Brother Shabir Ali, he's going to be opening this uh, topic. 10 minutes rebuttal for, from Dr. Moray. Then 20 minutes again from Dr. Moray. And 10 minutes from Ali. After that, it will be a question-answer session. And, uh, well, that's the fun part. So, 
Uh, right now, we I would like to invite Brother Shabir Ali to start his time on the topic of is the God of Islam a true or a false God? Mr. Ali, whenever you're ready, let us know. I'm ready to go. Time starts. Praise be to Allah, Lord of the worlds. Peace and blessings be on his noble messenger. Ladies and gentlemen, before I begin, let me put before you that it was not my idea to have two topics. I like to deal with one thing at a time. We give enough time to explore the topics very carefully. We go back and forth and we wrangle out all the finer points. However, I had made a challenge to Dr. Mori on a particular topic. He declined from that challenge and he re-challenged me on the two topics which I gladly accepted and I'm debating with him tonight. However, since we are here, I'll take a, a moment out of my 20 minutes to now issue that challenge to Dr. Robert Mori one more time. Dr. Mori, I challenge you to debate the topic, is Allah a correct name for the God of Abraham? And since you have indicated to me that it would be very expensive for us to bring you to Toronto, uh, I would come to Pennsylvania, your home state, and have the debate with you there. Do you accept? And at some time you can indicate... At some time... At some time you can reply whether you do accept to have that debate with me. Good. Uh, also in Pennsylvania. But you see, you're not answering to what I say. I'm saying I... Excuse I'm me, saying Excuse me both speakers. Yes. Uh, if you want to debate this between the two of you outside of this arena, I would appreciate that. Let us keep the subject and, and, and the topic focused as we plan. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, who exactly is Allah? According to all the scholars I have been reading, it is quite clear that in Mecca, in the environment where the Quran was first revealed, the people worshipped many gods. They had 360 idols. But in addition to all of these idols, they worshipped what they called the High God. And they called him Allah. But that God was the God of Abraham for them. It was the unseen God that they called out to when they were alone and they could not have access to their other gods. It is quite clear to all of these scholars without exception that this was the case in Arabia. Dr. Mori is quite alone in saying that Allah was not the God of Abraham, not the God of the Bible, but that he was the moon God of Arabia. Some other scholars like Dr. Mori had said that Allah in the Quran is not like Yahweh of the Bible. And they show us some differences in characteristics between Yahweh and Allah, the way they're described in the Bible and in the Quran. And I will agree with them for other reasons. Yes, Allah as described in the, in the Quran is much different from Yahweh as described in the Bible on several points. However, we're dealing here with the same individual, the same God, who the Bible calls Yahweh or El or Elohim or Eloah, and whom the Quran calls Allah. There are sometimes some differences in characteristics. For example, the Bible will often depict Yahweh as walking, for example, in the garden and rustling the feathers with his feet. But the Quran will not accept any such description of God. These anthropomorphic ideas are wholly absent from the Quran. However, we're still dealing with the same person. According to many passages of the Bible, Yahweh has a son. According to the Quran, Allah has no son, but again, the Quran is dealing with the same Yahweh and saying that Yahweh does not have a son, except that the Quran is calling him Allah, not Yahweh. I have proven elsewhere that Yahweh is a name that arose by mistake. And this is why I'm challenging Dr. Robert Mori on that particular topic, and he's avoiding the issue. But that challenge still remains. We're doing a debate tonight, and I'm also challenging him on another debate. But however, Dr. Mori has quoted people like Caesar Farah to help his cause, to prove that Allah was the moon god of Arabia. But let me read you what Caesar Farah says in his book. I'm reading you from my transcript, but I also have the book. We can check and compare to see if my transcript is right. And during the break at some point, I will ask my volunteers to go around and give you a copy of this transcript, and you can check this at your convenience anytime. Caesar Farah says, quote, Allah, the paramount deity of pagan Arabia, was the target of worship in varying degrees of intensity from the southernmost tip of Arabia to the Mediterranean, 
To the Babylonians, he was ill, God. To the Canaanites and later the Israelites, he was El. The South Arabians worshipped him as Elah. And the Bedouins as al Ilah, the deity. With Muhammad, he becomes Allah, God of the worlds, of all believers, the one and only who admits no associates or consorts in the worship of him. Judaic and Christian concepts of God abetted the transformation of Allah from a pagan deity to the God of all monotheists. There is no reason, therefore, to accept the idea that Allah passed to the Muslims from Christians and Jews. See Zafira, page 28. According to Farah, same God was called Il by the Babylonians, El by the Israelites. We know that word in the Bible, El, it's the God of Abraham. That same God is called Allah. And he is the God of all monotheists. That means of Christians, Muslims, and Jews, according to Caesar Farah. However, Dr. Robert Morey quoted Caesar Farah in his book, in his book on page 13, a book entitled The Moon God Allah in the Archaeology of the Middle East. Dr. Morey quoted that book by saying that Caesar Farah said this, There is no reason, therefore, to accept the idea that Allah passed on to the Muslims from the Christians and Jews. And then he used that quotation to establish that Muslims are not worshipping the same God which the Jews and Christians are worshipping. In his book on page 13. You are right, Dr. Mori. This debate is not about you. This debate is about the question. This debate is about the question, is Allah a true God or a false God? But incidentally, as we deal with the evidence at hand, it at, the, at once shows that according to all of these academic scholars, there is no doubt Allah was the true God and the God of Abraham. Secondly, it comes out in the wash that there is something here about Dr. Mori's ability and competence to use quotations. That he quotes his sources inaccurately. Sometimes he uses deceptive quotes. Sometimes he think, pulls things out of context and gives them a meaning which it does not have. And un unfortunately, it comes out in the wash. It's not my intention to attack Dr. Mori. It is my intention to reveal the truth. And the truth is that what Dr. Mori called the Quran actually belongs to him. And this is coming out. Dr. Mori should explain to us how he misquoted Caesar Farah like that. Farah says one thing, Dr. Mori says that Farah says another thing. Dr. Mori quotes from Professor Kuhn, Carlton Kuhn. And I have Carlton Kuhn's writing here with me. I have the book, Southern Arabia. And he quotes from Carlton Kuhn. First I'll read you what Carlton Kuhn actually said. I am co listen, this, this is the topic. The topic is, is Allah a true God or false God? We're also dealing with Dr. Mori's use of, this, of his quotations. Well, listen, is Allah a true God or false God? Kuhn actually said, quote, The God Il, Il or Ilah was originally a phase of the moon God. But early in Arabian history, listen, you, I will repeat what I will say, okay? However, don't interrupt me, please. Excuse Don't interrupt me. Excuse we can get me. the tape later on. Excuse me, both speakers again, and I stop the stopwatch. I would ask Dr. Murray to refrain from the interference into the discussion uh, until uh, Mr. Ali's presentation is finished. Thank you. And I would ask Mr. Ali to refrain from personal attacks. Thank you both. Now, well, it's very easy. All Dr. Murray has to come and disprove me. Show I'm wrong. He will speak too, wouldn't he? Let him show that what I'm recording is wrong. Mr. Okay. Ali, please Mr. continue Kuhn. with your presentation. No interruption from the audience. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Carlton Kuhn actually said, the god Il, or Ilah, was originally a phase of the moon god. But early in Arabian history, the name became a general term for God. And it was this name that the Hebrews used prominently in their personal names, such as Emmanuel. Israel, etc., rather than the bowel of the northern Semites proper, which was the sun. Similarly, under Muhammad's tutelage, the relatively anonymous Ilah became Al Ilah, the God, or Allah, the Supreme Being. Carlton Kuhn, Southern Arabia, Washington, D.C., Smithsonian, 1944, published, page 399. Now, according to Kuhn, it's quite clear, at one time, Ilah, not Allah, Ilah, an Arabic word different from Allah, Ilah was a phase of the moon god, but, 
But early in Arabian history, something else happened. That name became a general term for God. And it is the same El that's used in Hebrew names like Israel, Ishmael. You know other names, Beth El. You know Emmanuel, which is the name according to many Christians for Jesus. So the same El, Dr. Mori has been arguing this is the moon god of Arabia. Now he quoted Carlton Kuhn's statement, but what did he quote? He quoted Carlton Kuhn as saying, the god Il or Ilah was originally a phase of the moon god. Period. He didn't even say dot, dot, dot. He didn't say but so and so. So he misquoted Carlton Kuhn. This is like one of you saying about a certain man, he is a nice man, but you know he steals. So then he goes to apply for a job, collecting money, and he says, well, such and such said, I am a nice man, period. What about the part about but he steals? Carlton Kuhn did say, originally, Il or Ilah was a phase of the moon god. But he also said, but so-and-so happened. Well, how could you misquote like that, Dr. Mori? Ladies and gentlemen, we, we call this debate an academic debate. So we expect that both speakers should use academic integrity, intellectual honesty, and good old-fashioned Christian love for truth. This is what we expect in this debate. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, again and again, we find that according to all the scholars, Allah was never moon god. Moon god was called Il or Ilah, but not Allah. Irrelevant archaeological evidence. Dr. Mori will show you a number of pieces of archaeological evidence, as he has shown in his book, The Moon God Allah. But all of this do not prove anything. They prove that the moon god was worshipped outside of Arabia, in Canaan, in the biblical lands. Then, after he has spent many pages and many illustrations showing us moon god here, moon god there, then he goes to southern Arabia, but he does not get into Mecca where the Quran was revealed. And while he's showing us pictures and things about Southern Arabia, he's convincing us in his writings, and I have all the quotations to prove, as though he's speaking about Northern Arabia, whereas in fact he is not. He's speaking about Southern Arabia in the Hadramaut area. Now when he reveals that information, he does deal with the finding of Carlton Kuhn. And Mori has shown us a picture of a woman-like statue. And he says that this may have been and an idol of the moon god, an idol of the moon god may have been. That he says on page 7. But on page 6, when he labeled the diagram, he said, <laughs> the moon god, an idol of the moon god. He doesn't say any more may have been. Then later on in the same book, he says, now we have actual idols of the moon god. So now what may have been is now actual, by the time he gets to the end of the book. And now what was one idol is now idols. Which page of Maury's book should we believe and which part of his presentation we'll wait to see. I hope he has some more convincing evidence than what I've been able to find in his writings. Furthermore, Dr. Maury says that he found some inscriptions connected with this moon god in southern Arabia. And the inscriptions show that the name of that moon god was Sin, was Sin, not Allah. So now Mori had to do an about face. Because in his book, The Islamic Invasion, he kept arguing and insisting and quoting many authorities to show that Allah was a name. Now he found from the inscriptions of Southern Arabia that the name of the moon god in that region was not Allah, but Sin in the Hadramaut area. So now, instead of abandoning what he wrote previously and apologizing for his previous mistake, he compounded it by now claiming in his book, The Archaeology, written two years later, by now claiming that although the name was Sin, but the title was Allah. You see, now he makes an about face claiming that Allah is no longer a name but a title. I think, Dr. Mori, it's easier and much more honorable to admit as human beings we do make mistakes and let us move on. There is nothing to connect the name Allah with the moon god of ancient Arabia. Optical delusions. In this book, The Moon God Allah in the Archaeology of the Middle East, of, uh, the Archaeology of the Near East, uh, Dr. Mori showed us a picture on page 3 and several other pictures which from the looks of it, the implication is that these are all pictures of the moon god. 
However, I saw one of these pictures cropping up in one book after another, again and again. And I have at least three, maybe four books here with these pictures in them. And this picture, ladies and gentlemen, is not a picture of any moon god, but according to all of these sources and references, are the picture of Baal, the god of lightning. Dr. Mori, where did you find that this was a picture of the moon god? We'd like to know that. Ladies and gentlemen, again and again we see that what we are being told is not uh, really what is there. Now back to the real issue. The real issue is that, don't take this as any victory, it's only an expression. Or I should say then, to, if it might satisfy you, the real crux of the matter that will really disprove Mori, if you like that better, is that even if you find evidence that the moon god was worshipped anywhere in the world, whether outside of Arabia, even in southern Arabia, as Dr. Mori has tried to prove, and I agree with him, moon god was worshipped in ancient Arabia, even if you go to Mecca and prove that the moon god was worshipped there, it doesn't mean that the moon god is still being worshipped in Islam. Although this is the impression that Dr. Mori's writings give, and even actual some of his words in the moon god of, uh, uh, of, the, middle, of the ancient Near East, even in that book he, gives wor he uses words which give that impression. And Jack Chick, a certain writer, took up upon that idea and wrote a book, or a little book that Allah had no son, in which he shows Muslims worshipping and a Christian explaining to his son uh, they're worshipping their moon god, Allah, son. Yeah. This is the kind of false information that goes out there. So the real issue then is not whether the moon god was worshipped outside of Arabia. Now, Dr. Mori should know what is the real issue. The real issue is, is Islam worshipping a moon god? Are Muslims worshipping that? First of all, the Meccans were not worshipping a moon god. Secondly, the Quran says again and again that everything are the creatures of Allah. Particularly in the Quran in Surah 41, ayah number 47. It says in the Quran, adore not the sun and the moon but adore Allah who created them. Ladies and gentlemen, does it sound like the Quran is telling anybody to worship a moon god or denying that this should be worshipped? Dr. Mori knew about this reference in the Quran, Surah 41 verse 37, because he referred to it but by number only. In his book, The Islamic Invasion, in page 42, he referred to this by number, but he didn't say what the verse said. He didn't want people to know that this verse refutes moon worship because this would fall his entire theory to the floor. Dr. Mori concealed other evidence too. He talks again and again about the findings in South Arabia, in the Hadramaut area, from the Kataban, the Timna and Ma'arib area. He says thousands of Sabian, Minian and Katabanian inscriptions were subsequently translated. But Dr. Mori didn't tell us what these inscriptions actually said apart from his revelation that they declared that the moon god's name was Sin, not Allah. But I have found, by going through the records of this, and I have them all translated here in a book, The Ancient Near East, by James Pritchard and his team, there you find that the, the gods that were described there are not Allah, but they are Anbi, Wad, they are Sin, Atar, Am, and one more thing. One Katabanian inscription reveals something interesting. It had the name of a god written as L-Y-N, L-Y-N. And according, consonants only, and according to James Pritchard, he says that, looking at that word, it may be graphically compared with the divine epithetum in the Old Testament Elion, from Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 8, according to Pritchard, volume 2, page 239. So, the God of the Bible was worshipped in that region too. Would Mori make that clear to us, that that God was also worshipped there? Not only the moon God, but the God of Abraham, the God of the Bible, was also worshipped there. Now, the fact that we use a name which was already used for God before Islam, this is no problem. In the Old Testament, El is used for God, but El was also used by pagans. Baal is also used for God on a couple of occasions. That name is also used for the pagan gods. In the New Testament, God is called Hotheos. Mori, would you admit that the god Jupiter in New Testament times was also called Hotheos? And what problem does that present for Christianity? Nothing. It's not what you call the god, but what characteristics you describe concerning him.
And that decides whether Allah is the true God or false God. In addition to that, Allah is the true name for the God of Abraham, and that is the topic on which I challenge Dr. Mori for another debate in Pennsylvania. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Excuse me. Thank you. Now, Mr. Ali may step down and Dr. Mori for thinning, as some people do. Instead, I will not uh, even get on irrelevant issues. As I said, uh, my opponent has written many blasphemous things. I could have brought his books here and challenged him here, and he took this out of context. But you see, the debate issue was very clear. Is the God of Islam a true or false God? The first thing that he would have to do in a normal debate is to set forth a series of propositions in which he will prove that Allah is a true God. He has not done this. Instead, he has taken the red herring approach of attacking me personally with what is called smoke and mirrors. If you will notice toward the end of his presentation, after all of his thunder and lightning and, and weaving, he meekly, and I'm, I wrote these down, he said, I'll admit that the ancient Arabs worshipped the moon god in southern Arabia. He said that. He said he's even willing to admit that the moon god was worshipped at Mecca. He quoted sources which pointed out that the moon god's title was Elah, which I, of course, he wouldn't have found those sources if he wouldn't have found them in my book, which led him to those sources. Now, in addition to all the sources that he has quoted, and which I quoted about the time frame. We're talking about the origin of words. You have, for example, here in Yusuf Ali's own Quran, uh, when we have a passage where Muhammad is swearing by the moon, uh, Yusuf Ali explains the reason why Muhammad felt it would be important to the Arabs that he would swear by the moon. And I will now read his comment. The moon, next after the sun, is the most striking luminary to our sight. Its reflected light has for us even a greater mystery than the direct light of the sun, which uh, looks to us like pure fire. The moon was worshipped as a deity in times of darkness. I did give the archaeological evidence where a moon temple was dug up in southern Arabia. I showed it was southern Arabia. I even gave a map of southern Arabia. I never said it was northern Arabia, which means he cannot read uh, what I have written. Um, the evidence also is found in other Islamic works here in dealing with fabled cities, princes and jinn from Arab myths and legends. In the section dealing with the major gods in pre-Islamic times, he starts out, the most famous of these were Alat, Aluz, and Manat. The first three were thought to be the daughters of Allah. So whatever Allah that was believed in by the pagans had three daughters. This, I submit, for him to say that is the God of Abraham, and Isaac, and Jacob is a great feat. Because with one breath, he wants to say that the God of the Bible had no sons, and also no daughters, but the Allah that was believed in and worshipped at the Kaaba by the pagans had three daughters. So who, whatever Allah that was, it was not the Allah of the Bible or the Allah of Islam, or hence all of us would be running after Alat, Aluza, and Manat. It also points out that they worshipped the moon, the stars, and particularly the star Al-Sahara, and they worshipped Saturn, Mercury, Jupiter, the star Sirius, and the constellations, etc. It gives Wad, it gives Hubble, it gives Manat. And in one of the books, which I brought with me, which will give you an illustration of the... Uh, one of the books, uh, which will give you an illustration of the deceptive tactics of Mr. Ali, you will notice the ad hominem using the word deceptive and dishonest and false quotations, he cannot show any place 
where I made up a quotation and attributed it to someone and pretended that they said it. Because everything I put down is there exactly what came from the page. His only complaint is an old logical thing. It's a fallacy saying, well, he didn't quote all of it. He didn't quote half of it. He didn't quote it. Well, no. In academia, you quote that part of the material which relates to what you're seeking to demonstrate. For example, in my first part of the book, I demonstrated that Allah as a name was known before Muhammad. And I quoted from the Encyclopedia Britannica and other things which said, before Muhammad, the word Allah was in use. That is what I quoted them to prove. Now, he pretends that I quoted them to prove that Allah was a moon god. If you look at my book, and thank you for publicizing my book on your radio program, the sales have reached uh, nice heights. But if you look carefully, uh, any, pub you know, any publicity is good publicity, you will find that he then quotes from the encyclopedia relating to what the word means now that it's a generic term, or later it meant. My interest was simply, and here is uh, from Alfred, I will now read you again. He refers to him here, and he says, here's what it really says, Maury's dishonest, Maury's this, Maury's that. Let me read to you what he did not put down. Let me read to you what he did not put down. And see, it's easy to say dishonest and point the finger, but how many fingers are pointing back to you? Listen to this, quote, some scholars trace the name, and this, I'll, I'll read, I'll get, get the contacts, the Arabian Ilah, familiar to us in the form Allah, which is compounded of Ah, the definite article, and Ilah by uh, eluding the vowel I is not clear. Some scholars trace the name to the South Arabian Ilah, a title of the moon god. He says, but this is a matter of antiquarian interest. Well, that is what I was talking about. Antiquarian interest is simply proving that the origin of the title which became the compound, and he says it was compounded, had to do with, as Yusuf Ali said and other writers, the moon god was worshipped by the pagans. The temple has been dug up. It's sitting there. Gertrude found it. For him to flim flam around and admit in the end that I was right. You'll notice at the end, he admitted, yeah, okay, they did worship the moon. Yeah, okay, so it was used of the moon god. But did he prove that Allah was anything more than a fake god? No. All that he did out of his 20 minutes was say, well, Bob Morris this. Bob Morey, I don't, am I God? I don't claim to be God. Bob Morey could be the biggest liar that ever lived and Allah still be a false God. Does disproving me prove Islam? I'm not that important, folks. I'm nobody. I, and see, this is why I feel logically we have a problem, Shabir. As I look at your frantic books, I've got to disprove the Bible. I've got to disprove the Trinity. I must disprove the... And you're frantic, frantic, working, working to disprove. You never prove anything you believe. You just say, all is God, and go on. The logical fallacy that he's operating under is this. If I can successfully attack and refute my opponent my view is automatically true and I don't have to prove it. Now you see, what if he is successful as he's tried to do to disprove Christianity? Well, we put Christianity in the trash and we don't have to go to church Sunday morning. Does that prove that the Quran or the Bhagavadita or the Vedas or the Book of... Does that prove that anybody else is right? See, when I look at this frantic thing, See, when I look at Islam, that doesn't prove, if I disprove the Quran, that doesn't prove the Bible, doesn't prove anything. All it proves is the Quran as, you know, is, is, not, is not a good piece of literature. It's filled with myths. His assumption tonight is that he will win against, he will prove Allah is God by refuting me? I'm nobody. No one. Zip. I'm not even Billy Graham. I don't have... Oh. I, I'm deeply honored that you have 
spent so much time on little old Bob Moy from Pennsylvania, but gee, you know, give me a break. I, I, I'm not Mr. Billy Graham or Josh McDowell. I mean, if you, you know, and here, if you want to disagree with these people, but you did agree, agree in the end, the moon god was worshipped. Yusuf Ali was right. This guy was right. Coons, I was quoting these men saying, when you trace the word back, you get to a moon god in the end. And all I'm saying in my argument, my conclusion, it was a pagan hajj, revamped, and now it's part of Islam, a pagan a fast, revamped, now part of Islam, and it was a pagan Allah who had three daughters, and not even you will say that's the true Allah with true daughters. You will deny that. Well, then it was a pagan Allah who was turned over and revamped, and the God, the substance, I the name is not important, the substance, when I get my 20 minutes, the nature of the God of Islam means that this is not the God revealed in Scripture. And we will see why. So I submit to you this evening um, that as Macbeth said, Ali was but a poor actor that but strutted and fretted his hour upon the stage. He was full of sound and fury signifying nothing because it is totally irrelevant when in the end he admitted they did worship a moon god. Elah was a title. I've said this. And one of the personal names I give many, Suin, Sin was, Sin I, the wilderness of sin. So that the realization comes to be that in the end, as with the first proposition, he had to admit that all of these things come out of the pagan myths and legends and fables and youths in the cave. And now he had to admit there was indeed a high god who was a pagan deity who had three daughters. If this is the Allah of Islam, then why aren't you worshiping Alat, Aluza, and Manat? Two minutes. I submit that there was a pagan god. This pagan god was a high god in a pantheon of deities. He was one of many gods. He was not worshiped as the one god, but a god who was the top dog. As such, as scholars have pointed out, and I do quote them correctly, and I will give you five dollars if you ever find any place where I made up a quotation. Notice he didn't say, see here, Dr. Morey made up the quotation. The book doesn't have it. I'll give you five dollars if, as you said, I falsify. I don't falsify. I quote them accurately. The reason you object is because of what I say so you attack me by calling me dishonest and you don't even know me? I could be mistaken. In the judgment of charity, I'll just say, you're, you know, I don't know your background, maybe you have no training in logic, and you don't realize that this kind of ad hominem thing is irrational. Thank you. End of the time allotment. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much, Dr. Moore. The second segment of topic two. Please let us know when you're ready, Dr. Murray. And Jesus Christ, the only crucified Son of God, and the scriptures, I bid you welcome. You must realize that every religion on this planet claims to worship the true God. After all, what religion would say, hello, I have a false God. Would you please believe in him? Do the Mormons come and say, Hi, I'm a false prophet. Can I damn your soul today? <laughs> Every religion believes they have the true God. That's why Hindus are Hindus. Buddhists are Buddhists, Christians, Muslims, Sikhs, Moonies, Zumis, Dumis, Baha'is. I don't care what you call them. They all believe we've got the true God. We have the true God. Is claiming it the same thing as proving it? I don't think so. You see, they can't all have the true God. Either one of them has the true God and the others are frauds, or they're all frauds and we can be atheists and we don't need to be here. We can be at the bar, 
and have a drink in one hand and a woman in the other and just kick back and enjoy life. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we're worm food. All right? But if there is a being the philosophers have described an infinite cosmic mind which created the universe and which put laws into the universe and thus gives significance and we somehow or the other created in his image and his likeness and we have intellect and we have emotion and we have will and man has a higher purpose well then it would be good to try to find out about this God and when you go shopping for a God Islam is not the only one in the cafeteria of religion they're all serving up a plate of true gods and so I don't begin with the assumption that Islam's God is any more true than any other religion we have to begin with the assumption they all are saying the same thing now logically speaking the burden of proof is on the Muslim at this part he has to prove that Allah is the true God as opposed to false gods. And the way he has to do it is twofold. One, positive demonstrations that this Allah, who or whatever it is, is indeed true, that is, he exists, and give some idea of what that existence means and that this God can communicate and has a certain character and nature. He also, in order to say true, by necessity, a principle called falsification, must attack other gods and say they're false. Now, in his writings, he has said the God of Christians, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is a false God. Well, that part you have fulfilled. He spends a great deal of time saying this is a false God, the false the deity of Christ is false, the Trinity is false. He has spent a great deal of time identifying false gods. The only trouble is, I don't see much in the realm of demonstrating positively that he has a true God. Running around and saying Allah is great, or that Allah is God, is not the same thing as proving it. He has the same burden of proof as any other cult, any other sect, any other religion. Now the second problem that we face beside that the average Muslim doesn't bother to prove anything he just shouts Allah's God and goes on the second problem is that the attributes of Allah as found in the Quran do not in any way relate to the concept of an ultimate being who is the quintessence of morality and virtue I do not want to worship a demon God any of you say oh I just love the demons well, if you're of Satanist, okay, maybe you would say that. Well, you see, there are certain concepts that relate that anything less than these things would not register as God. That's why, and maybe, maybe again, it's because I'm a Westerner and I'm speaking out of the context of, of being a philosopher. Any being that you would claim that is the true God by necessity must be a God of truth and could not be a God who is known for trickery, lies, deceit, hypocrisy, and contradiction. That is, if the God you believe in is anything less than the quintessence of truth and verity, that's no God at all. Now, when I turn to the Quran and I look in Surah 3 and it says, the unbelievers have done all their scheming and planning and trickery, but as a matter of fact, Allah is the greatest al makarin of them all. And then I go over to Dr. Gleason Archer, professor of Arabic, and we work together on his lexicons, and he comes back and he said, the word in Arabic is always used in the negative sense, liar, cheat, deceiver, and trickster. It's not a nice, in other words, if you were called that, you would not be calling me a nice thing. So here we have Allah described by this name, which means that he is a deceiver. And that is less than what could possibly qualify for deity. Then I go on and I read in Surah 1716 that before he destroys a village, he commands them and they sin and then he destroys them. 
And as I've read this in different translations, and there are books that get into the Arabic, and there are scholars who handle this, they say it's interesting that Allah has actually commanded the sin, and then he punishes them for it. And I, and I keep thinking that if there is a God, he's the quintessence of goodness, he himself could not be tempted by evil, neither indeed would he tempt anyone or do this. And here he wills them to unbelief, a very funny expression in Surah 789, where it says that if we apostasize, and if it's Allah's will, that we do so. How can you say in one breath, well, if we apostasize and fall away and get damned, well, it was the will of Allah anyway. That is sort of excusing human activity in some kind of hyper-sovereignty, fatalism, some kind of view of predestination that leaves no room for moral accountability. And this indeed is an old problem. I'm not the one to bring it up, so please don't attack me personally or my, the how I brush my teeth or something like that. The, the thousand years, Christian theologians had pointed out, fatalism in the theology of Islam really means no human responsibility. Allah is responsible for everything in the end anyway. Now, that gives me problems. In Surah 4, 171, and Surah 5, 16, Whoever, and supposedly Allah revealed the Quran, well, whoever this Allah was, he was ignorant. Again, for a God, a being to be God, he has to be omniscient. He says that the Trinity is the Father, the Mother, the Son, and that Mary is the second person of the Trinity. I have never met a Christian. There are Christians here tonight. Are there any Christians here who believe that, that Mary's the second person of the Trinity? Please raise your hand. The same thing when the Quran says that the Jews believe that Ezra is the Messiah. I have asked noted rabbis, and they said that's a lie. The Quran is an error. So if Allah gave that, he's an ignorant God. He doesn't know what Christians believe. He doesn't even know what Jews believe. Well, that can't be the true God. And then the paradise that is revealed. Oy vey, the paradise is a paradise for someone from San Francisco or someplace like this. I mean, I'm, I'm being honest as I read uh, in the book 99 Names for God by Judith Miller. Go in, you can go buy it, any mall. She quotes from the leading Egyptian cleric, the guy who's the numero uno preacher. And he says that in paradise we will have eternal erections and young boys with necklaces and rings that we can enjoy. And she's horrified. This is a correspondence for the New York Times. And I look at this wine, and you can't have wine here, but there are going to be rivers of it. And these whores, from which I now know the word whore came from, but they're all virgins, chained. And, and I look at this and I say, this is paradise only for a pervert, someone who is sexually twisted. And what about poor Muslim women here? Are there men waiting for you who are virgins and you'll get to have sex, some kind of eternal thing for you? And I said, mean the woman in eternity is just on a, on a couch? That's it? This, this doesn't sound like God to me any, by any stretch philosophically. And then Allah supposedly speaking in the Quran and he can't get his grammar right. I have a book which lists it. He confuses genders and numbers. I mean, if, if two people are going to the mall and you say Fred and Sam are going to the mall, but if you told me Fred and Sam is going, you'd say, now, wait a second, that's ignorant. Y you can't have a plural subject in a singular verb. Or if you have gender confusion, how in the world can this be Allah if he can't even talk right? He's talking as if he were Muhammad, a semi-illiterate Bedouin whom some writers describe as like Alibaba, the band of all the thieves. So that y you look at this and you say, well, how can that be Allah? Also, Allah supposedly contradicts himself all the time. In one place, he says eight days of creation. Another place, he says six days of creation. The book that was written against me finally concludes that two plus Four plus two is six. And I said, if your religion can't add two plus two, if Allah cannot even add two plus two is four, 
plus 4 is 8. Now, 8 is not 6. 6 is not... Well, then what type of God is this? It can't even add. And then this God, Allah, makes all these wild scientific errors. They look for the sun, and it went down sizzling in a muddy pond and all of that business. And, oh, I, I, I don't find that to be very instructive. This God is very ignorant. People turning into apes and all sorts of wild things. Uh, or this God, Allah, made historical errors. He talks about Samaritans when there no, was no Samaria. It's like you look in the Bible, if we picked it up, and it said, and Jesus went to get some Kentucky Fried Chicken, and he told the American to get his visa card. You'd say, well, the Bible's a crock. The, well, how can the Quran make all these historical errors about the Samaritans and about Alexander Grade and error after error that had been documented? Well, this Allah isn't doing too good. He really doesn't even remember history. And then this Allah, too, was mistaken when he said that he sent down the Quran in pure Arabic. I read it, and Muslims told me, and of course, they were lay people, lay Muslims. They said, oh, it's in pure Arabic, Dr. Modi, no variant readings. Doc. Then I talked to the Muslim scholars like Dr. Badawi and people like that, and they said, well, no, 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 there, there are foreign words, about 125 foreign words, Persian and Greek. And so it's not in Arabic. And when I read, behold, we have sent it down in Arabic, either he did or he didn't. So if... If, if that's a fraud, then evidently he goofed. Who, why would we say that Allah is God if he said one thing and turned around and abrogated it, such as the satanic verses? Uh, put something in the Quran, take it out. In the Meccan Qurans, uh, you would view me as a nice guy, people of the book. We'd all sing together. We are the Lords and all this. Then you get to the Medina, and it's kill them, crucify them, off with their heads, like the Queen of Hearts. So the other night, you know, people saying, we're going to kill you. Hey, what type of God are you worshiping that you run around and do things like that? Y y that doesn't sound like God to me. Thus, you see, the attributes of this Allah as revealed in his Quran, just philosophically, I don't think, approach the concept of the quintessence of morality and virtue and truthfulness and love. Where's love? In the name of love, I kill you? That, I don't find that. Well, what about the nature of this Allah? Remember, we learn in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 8, the Gentiles, he said, you used to worship gods who were by nature no gods at all. You see, you must have a god by nature, not just called a god. Well, they tell me, uh, you know, that they worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and of Jesus, and of the apostles. And in other words, the God of Islam will be the God of the Bible. Now, they get very funny, and I say, which Bible? And they say, well, whatever one, it's not the one you have. And I said, well, which one is that? When was it? You know, obviously, uh, in that one passage, and they said, what about this? He said, go ask the Jews to look in their Torah, and they'll tell you. So evidently, in the 7th century... He did have access to a Bible that wasn't corrupted, and I can go to the first century, and I have, you know, there's plenty of pre-Islamic biblical texts now, so I can say, well, let's check and see. Well, Allah is not the triune God of the Bible. The Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. And you've got to remember, uh, when Mr. Ali depends upon the Jehovah's Witnesses like Didot, for the arguments to try to say that the Bible doesn't teach it is the same thing as for me to go to Louis Farrakhan for the interpretation of Orthodox Islam. The nation of Islam, the black Muslims who believe, well, Farrakhan says he's Allah, okay? He's the Messiah, he's Allah. Well, as far. So that you must understand to go to apostates like Jehovah's Witnesses for the proof that the Trinity is not true is the same as me going to Louis Farrakhan for the proof that Allah is a black man who lives in this street right off of Chicago. It doesn't work. Allah is not the triune God of the Bible. Allah never became incarnate for us. We have no idea. He's an abstract being. He's distant. He never became man. He's not a savior. Never died for us. Does no redemption. You got to rock and roll on your own, baby. Row, row, row. Pray, pray, pray. Work your way to heaven. Put the oars, and if you don't work enough, well, there's the fire waiting for you. Now, according to the New Testament, 
1 John chapter 2 and verse 22, we said this is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. And then in case you don't get it, and he was the apostle of love, so this was very loving. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father. The one who confesses the Son has the Father. And I pick up the Quran, and the Allah of the Quran says, I don't have a Son. I deny that Jesus is the Son of God. Then according to this verse, Allah is the Antichrist. I mean, this is the New Testament, not me. I didn't write it. Don't need to blame me. Lastly, let's talk a little bit about the word Allah. I do personally feel that it is perhaps not an appropriate word that we should use unless you view it as a generic term like the English word God. Now let me explain to you Linguistics 101. A generic term means an empty word devoid of any meaning. So you have a box and it have the word God and you can put anything in there you want. A stuffed animal, that's God. Louis Farrakhan, that's God. If you say the word Allah is purely generic and Louis Farrakhan has the right to say, I, Louis Farrakhan, I am Allah, and you have no problem with that, well then I guess you can use it for whatever you want. But I'm finding most of my Muslim friends do not like the idea when Louis Farrakhan and other people use the word Allah. I mean, after all, with the Hindus, I have yet to meet a Muslim who says, well, I have no problem when the Hindus would say Kali is Allah, Shiva is Ali, Allah. Do you refer to Allah Shiva, Allah Krishna? Uh, you know, you can't have a double standard here. You, you have to say, well, maybe we shouldn't have this as a generic term. And thus I find a little bit of schizophrenia among Muslims. One side they say it's a generic term. Two minutes. The other side it isn't a generic term. I wish they would make up their mind. I mean, what are you going to do? The, the missionaries, perhaps they made a mistake. I'm willing to admit that. Hey, nobody's perfect. Even I make mistakes. So if he proves to you tonight, Dr. Morey on page five made a mistake. So what? I can document dozens of mistakes from him. They didn't prove anything. But what you must see is that if you're going to say Allah can be applied to Hinduism, to Buddhism, to Taoism, then you really run into problems. What you perhaps should say is that if the God of Christians is the same God as Muslims, then why do they kill Christians as infidels? Why do they view them as infidel? Why do they burn the churches? Why in Malaysia it's, it's illegal for Christians to use Allah, according to the news reports? Well, you see, it all goes back to this generic thing that Allah had three, three daughters. I don't know which one was daddy's girl. Some people say it was Allah, which is the feminine form. But you see, you have this whole problem that the rituals connected with this pagan high god have been swung over into Islam. And I just simply look at this and I say, look, if Islam adopted one of the titles shortened to Allah, the rituals, the crescent moon symbol, it's their people. Did I invent the crescent moon symbol? Does it sit on the mosques? Sits on the mosques. I got photos of it. I didn't invent it. It's there for some reason. And then denied that his wife, it simply moved it on over. The God of Islam looked at it philosophically in terms of attributes, in terms of nature. That's more important than, than fighting over uh, the etiology. And of course, I've already proven and he's admitted that originally in Southern Arabia it did refer to the moon God. Hey, let's, let's get it straight. But that doesn't mean anything. That's right. Time is up. I will simply submit Allah is a false God. Thank, Thank you, you Dr. Dr. Mori. Dr. Mori has said that in a normal debate, certain things that are happening here tonight wouldn't happen, and he's right. But this is not a normal debate. I'm not an inexperienced man. I've had dialogues with many fine Christian gentlemen. Tonight, this debate is different. Dr. Mori quoted me as saying, or as admitting that the moon god was worshipped at Mecca. 
Ladies and gentlemen, the tapes will be available. I never said any such thing. Doctor, Excuse previously he said it and I this wrote it down. Allowed. This is no what he said. From and the, the audience, tape please. also has him on it too. And we won't be editing the tape. Secondly, he said that I also admitted that it was possible for Muhammad to write the Quran. I never said any such thing. I said it was impossible. I said that Mori was trying to prove that it is possible. If everything he said is true, then that is what he establishes. I have established that it is impossible. Dr. Mori, don't put words into my mouth. But in the same way that Dr. Mori has been misquoting me, he has also been misquoting his sources. Dr. Mori, I don't want your five dollars, all right? Our Sheikh Dida usually offers a hundred. But I have with me, ladies and gentlemen, and I'd like to get them for you. Also for publicizing my radio program. You publicize my radio program, I'll publicize your book. And let the people hear both sides and come to the truth, all right? Ladies and gentlemen, a must read for you. Dr. Mori showed you that on the slide. I can't show you on the slide because it's not a transparency. However, Mori wanted to show that what I quoted from him is not true. But uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'd ask you to be the judge. Here I have page 50 from Mori's book, the chapter dealing with the moon god. And here Dr. Mori has said, he said the moon god was called by various names, one of which was Allah. According to Mori, what was the moon god called? Allah. He says reference number 17. When I check reference number 17, it's this book, a copy of which he did bring up with him to the stage, a book by Alfred Guillaume. So then I go to the page where he said he got it from an Alfred Guillaume. See, I went out and I bought the book, and I brought you a copy to see if Alfred, if Alfred Guillaume on page 7 actually said that Allah was the moon god. Now here, Alfred Guillaume says, Hell in ancient Israel. And then he says, and I have to get closer. Mm. Thank you very much. Some scholars trace the name to the South Arabian Elah, a title of the moon god. According to Mori, Allah was the name of that moon god. I'll show you that one more time, ladies and gentlemen. According to Mori, Allah was the name of that moon god. He said he got that from Alfred Guillaume, page 7. I go to Alfred Guillaume, page 7, where my finger is. It doesn't say that Allah was the moon god, but it says Elah was the title of the moon god. According to Mori, Allah, according to Gilom, Ila. That's not the same, Dr. Mori. And I will read for what follows. Now, I will. Yes, exactly. No interference from the audience, please. First of all, otherwise you will be dismissed. First please. of all, I have already earned the five dollars, but I won't claim it. Secondly, secondly, the passage continues. In Arabia, Allah was known from Christian and Jewish sources as the one God. And there can be no doubt whatever that he was known to the pagan Arabs of Mecca as the supreme being. Yes, Ilah in the South Arabia was the moon god, but in Mecca, Allah was the supreme being, the same as what was known to Christians and Jews, according to Alfred Guillaume. Ladies and gentlemen, someone also brought me a copy of the Sahih Bukhari, which was in dispute. And I have it here, number 367, hadith number 367 from volume 1. Ladies and gentlemen, it doesn't say penis, it says thigh, thigh, uh, and, and, and it says thigh. Again, here in the Arabic, it says fakhiz, fakhiz, fakhiz. It does not say penis. And it does not say the thing between the two thighs. I think Dr. Mori must have mis mistaken one of the thighs here for thing, and so he made that mistake. But I, I think that there is no excuse for the Arabic scholar in the audience who also checked it and found thing. It doesn't say that in the Arabic or in the English, and may God forgive those who commit errors and guide them to the truth of Islam. Ladies and gentlemen, we can prove again and again that what is being quoted to us and being told to us is not really true. Dr. Moore quoted from Carlton Kuhn, and he showed pictures of a woman-like figure, and then he said, now we have an actual idol of the moon god. But Carlton Kuhn, who supposedly made those amazing discoveries, in his book he said here on page 399, there were no carved images of these three, that is the three gods that were worshipped in Arabia, Venus, the sun, and the moon. Then he says, what we do find are images of people. So according to Kuhn, all we found are images of people. He made those discoveries. He ought to know what he discovered. There was not in a moon god image in South Arabia. Yes, the moon god was worshipped in South Arabia, but no image of that moon god was found. Only inscriptions which says its name was Sin, not Allah. And so we're far removed from what we're trying to prove. So, 
Dr. Mori, through a lot of red herrings, trying to show that the Quran has, you know, this description of Allah which he doesn't agree with, that description which he doesn't agree with, and so Allah is not the true God. It doesn't work that way, ladies and gentlemen. And I will not follow those red herrings. For one thing, I don't have the time to deal with them. But I can show you the reverse. Suppose I say that Yahweh described in the Bible uh, is described with certain attributes, with certain attributes which I don't like. That doesn't mean to say that I'm saying that Yahweh is the false God. I'm saying that Yahweh is the true God, and I repeat that for you. However, I can show you the many things in the Bible which describe Yahweh which, with which I don't agree. For example, Dr. Mori, you said that God does not tempt anyone when you are attacking Allah of the Quran. But how come in Genesis chapter 22 verse 1 it says that Yahweh did tempt Abraham? So if you have a trouble with terms, for example, when the Quran uses the term makirin, that God is the best of planners or plotters, when a word is applied to deity, it doesn't have the same meaning as it is applied to someone else. For example, if you say that Solomon built the temple, that does not mean the same thing as saying that the workers he employed built the temple. You have to understand the difference in meaning of words. When the Bible says that God repented, that Yahweh repented of the evil which he thought to do to Israel. Now can any Christian or Muslim imagine that Yahweh or Allah was sitting there planning evil and then he repented because he had planned that evil? No, you must say that the word evil here has a different meaning. So if you're going to excuse the Bible on that basis, why not also the Qur'an? And this is our problem continuously. Why use this, the standards from outside of Christianity and Islam in order to defeat Islam? We're not talking as Western scholars here, we're speaking as Muslims and Christians. And yes, to speak about Allah, the burden of proof is not on the Muslims to prove that Allah is the true God against the atheists. Between Muslims and Christians, all Muslims have to do is to establish that Yahweh of the Bible is also Allah of the Quran. To go to the Quran and attack Allah, you know, that this description of him is not right, not that one, not that one, this is missing the point. Let us go to the Bible and see what we read about Yahweh. And you decide, my Christian friends, whether that's the Yahweh you always knew. You must say you disagree. Two minutes, please. You must say you disagree with those descriptions, but not with the, with the true God at all. You know the song, The Rivers of Babylon. It goes by the rivers of Babylon. Now, I can't sing well, but you know the words. Did you know that those words come from Psalm 137? And did you ever read Psalm 137 to find out that according to that psalm, a blessing is announced on anyone who will grab a Babylonian baby and smash it against a rock? Is that Yahweh prescribing that? Now, I will disagree with that description, but still Yahweh is the true God. So even if a Christian dis disagrees with the some certain descri descriptions about Allah in the Quran, that does not prove that Allah is the false God. According to the Bible, God appointed Saul as king. But when God, when God declared to Saul that he must go out and kill his enemies, Saul came back with the live oxen and sheep. But God was not happy. God wanted him to kill even the oxen and sheep. And then the Bible says in, in 1 Samuel chapter 15 that God repented that he had made Saul king over Israel because he wouldn't kill off even the oxen and sheep. When Joshua was told to go into the Holy Land, he was told to kill everything that breathes. Now Muslims and Christians may both have difficulty with that description of Yahweh, but that doesn't prove that Yahweh is the false God. Muslims and Christians will find difficulty when the Bible says that wine cheers up God and man. They may say, what sort of God is that, that he becomes happy when he drinks wine? So we might argue with that description, but not the fact that Yahweh is the true God. In a similar way, Allah is the true God, even though Dr. Mori might have some trouble with some of the descriptions in the Quran. But we have shown, ladies and gentlemen, again and again, that the evidence that Dr. Mori has been using are a lot of false evidence and we've been able, alhamdulillah, praise be to God, to demonstrate it on the slide for you as well. And transcripts of my Time speeches will be distributed you to you much, momentarily. Mary. Please thank you down. very much. He was from God. An angel could be deceiving. Well, that question goes to Brother Shabir Ali. There is much to show that the Prophet Muhammad on whom be peace did not write the Quran but that this was revealed to him by God Almighty. Now, we can raise the question, how do we know that some deceiving spirit didn't speak to him? I wish that people would raise this question concerning St. Paul as well, for example, or concerning Jesus or Moses. But according to R.V.C. Bodley, 
Let me answer the question. Hold on. I'm please, answering the please question. Please give him the two minutes to answer. Hold on. Please. I'm showing you how to evaluate the question, how to think about this matter. If you're thinking about deceiving spirits, you must think whether a deceiving spirit came to either Moses or Jesus or Paul or Muhammad. Why only Muhammad? I mean, ask the same question regarding everyone. Now, regarding the Prophet Muhammad and whom be peace, we've seen much evidence to show that his claim that the Quran was being revealed to him is absolutely true. He challenged, if anyone can produce a book like the Quran, let them bring it forth. Nobody could. The Quran says... Excuse me, Saudi no interference from the public, otherwise thing. I'll dismiss the Some whole session. people have made attempts to produce something like the Quran, but if you bring it here today, bring Taha Hussein's Quran and read it here today and let all the Muslims be in shame. But why, why do you have it somewhere in the background and you claim that some other book? Bring it here. Allah says, bring your evidence if you are truthful. Bring it if you are truthful in Kuntum Sadiqeen. فَإِلَمْ تَفْعَلُوا and you know Arabic, well, you can never do it. Okay. That's the answer to the question. You the speaker at this time, I would, as on. much as I ask the audience to be quiet, I would like to ask the speaker to focus on the topic Thank as well, please. Much. But this is, I'm answering the question. The question, let me Arabic. repeat the question again, just in case. No, please don't. I've heard the question. You heard the question? My time. Yes. Okay, let's go. The question is, what proof is there that the Prophet Muhammad got the Quran by revelation and not from some de deceiving spirit? This Quran challenged that nobody can produce a book like it and nobody, not even Ta'a Hussein, had produced a book like it. The Quran re repeated that challenge many times. Nobody has been able to do that. How did the Prophet Muhammad on whom be peace author a book that he alone and the whole world can author? Nobody else can produce a book like that. Not even one surah like its 114 surahs. It's impossible. Furthermore, we find that uh, the Quran speaks about many things which was not known to the Prophet Muhammad or to his contemporaries with him, but these things are discovered many centuries later and they prove absolutely true. Time is up. Quran Thank you. Thank you for the response. Yes. No, no, no. Here, 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 here. Okay, go ahead. All right. <laughs> Was that starts. specific enough? Well, I mean, when I see the World Trade Building exploded and they were going to do, uh, they were going to off ambassadors and they, I see the terrorism going on, I, I see things happening. Yes, I am concerned because there are those Muslims, like Louis Farrakhan and others, who have said they want to destroy America. So the, uh, the people in Iran, people in Iraq have said death to America. They want to destroy this country. They want to destroy the churches. How else would I feel when I have people who tell me, when I have books saying we want to kill you? When my wife picks up the phone, we're going to rape you. We're going to kill you. Well, wouldn't you be afraid of those kinds of people? Very simple. Thank you. Thank you. question is for Shabir Ali, according to the Bible, Israel was the name given to Jacob, the grandson of Abraham. Ishmael was the son of Abraham. How could the Israelites be the Ishmaelites? Okay. The, the questioner seems to have a confusion. Nobody claims that the Israelites are, are the Ishmaelites. They're two different sets of people. The Ishmaelites are the descendants of Ishmael and the Israelites are the descendants of uh, Israel. But this all relates to the question of how do we trace the descendants of Abraham. According to the Bible, a certain place is blessed and that place is called the Valley of Bacca. According to that same Psalm, Psalm 84, that valley of Bacca has a house of worship and the people are ever praising God at that particular valley and they make it a place of springs, Psalm 84. The Bible says, blessed is anyone who sets his heart on pilgrimage to that place. Actually, Bacca is another name for Mecca, according to the Quran, inna awwala baytin wudi alin nasi lalladhi bi Bakata mubaraka. According to the Quran, the first place house of worship was constructed at Bakka for the worship of the one true God. And that actually is Mecca to which Muslims make pilgrimage today. It was constructed by Abraham and according to the Bible, blessed is anyone who makes pilgrimage to that place. So the descendants who lived in that place, they were descendants of Ishmael, not of Israel. They're not the Israelites, but Ishmaelites. And uh, they continued many of the practices from Abraham, like sacrificing. Abraham was to sacrifice his son. God told him no sacrifice the animal instead, which God God provided and yearly um, the, the pagans used to continue the 
the practice of Abraham by sacrificing an animal every year. And similarly, Muslims too, to, till today, continue that sacrifice. And that shows that the, the Muslims descending from uh, Ishmael, they continue that practice, showing themselves to be the true descendants of Abraham. Because according to the Bible, Jesus said, if you're the descendants of Abraham, you should do the things that Abraham did, according to John chapter 8 in the Bible. Thank you very much. Thank you. You can probably remain close. Okay. <laughs> you can just All right. <laughs> the question to Dr. Murray. Why won't you accept, he meant accept, Mr. Shabir's challenge to debate about whether Allah is the true God of Abraham, like he expected your challenge to debate about today's topics? Well, the question, okay, the question the is answered come. in the affirmative. How many of you sitting here saw us debate the proposition, is Allah a true or false God? Please raise your hand. How many of you sitting here saw us discuss the etymology of the words Allah, Alilah, compound? Did any of you, did, how many of you see we discussed that? Then we have done the debate. Thank you. Question to Mr. Ali. Please step up. Why the, is, why, no. why the Islam using the moon crest as a symbol on the, on the prayer building? Is that prayer building? Prayer. Yes. And the prayer, why is Islam using the moon crest on the, as a symbol on the prayer building? The crescent symbol in Islam actually did not originate with Islam. Somehow it seems that in the Middle Ages, the Turks adopted this as their symbol, and many Muslim nations later on copied them. Uh, it, it seems that people usually want something to label themselves by, but that does not necessarily mean that they worship that, and this needs to be made clear. Although some people give the indication, if you want to know the Muslims are really worshipping the moon god, go see what they have on the minarets on top of the mosques. But this is entirely false. Just as the early Christians did not worship the fish symbol, just as the Taoists do not worship their symbol, the yin-yang symbol. Just as the Buddhists do not worship their eight-spoke wheel, the Muslims do not worship the crescent moon. It would be a good point if somebody can say to the Muslims, look, your original Islam does not teach you to have a crescent symbol, so you shouldn't have it. Maybe that's a good point. But to say, look, you've got the crescent symbol, that means you're worshipping moon god, that's entirely false. The farthest thing from any Muslim's mind is to worship anything other than Allah. The one God of Abraham, whom Jesus said, that they may know you as the only true God, and that they may know Jesus, your messenger, as Christ. It is that one true God that Jesus spoke about, and he himself worshipped, according to the Gospel of John, chapter 17, verses 1 to 3. According to Matthew, Jesus fell on his face and prayed to that one true God. It is the same God that Muslims today fall on their faces and worship. So the star and moon crescent does not have anything to do with the worship of Islam. It just has to do something with identification or labeling. Instead of having a cross, which Muslims do not believe in, some Muslims prefer to have a crescent. I prefer to have nothing. I prefer to have it the way it was originally in the days of the Prophet, peace be upon him. There was no symbol for Islam. I thank you. Thank you. Now the question for Dr. Mori. It's kind of a good exercise going back and forth, I guess, for both speakers. Yeah, we, need a, we need a little bit of... Okay, the question is, you claim that the Holy Quran is false. Is the virgin birth of Mary also false? And if not, would you be willing to read the Surah 19, verse 19 to 22? And if not, why, Robert? Um, in logic, there is a fallacy call trying to attribute the attributes of a part to the whole. That is, if you have a machine and it has a square bolt, does that mean that every single part of the machine is also a square bolt? To say that the Quran is a mixture of fables, lies, frauds, historical truths, like who would the blind man came to Muhammad, and Muhammad ignored him because he was blind and poor. That probably happened. I have no problem. This person is assuming that I'm saying there's nothing that is in the Quran that is true. That is a logical fallacy. Of course, I do not think I have ever seen a book in my life 
that doesn't have some truths in it. Even if the person says he went to New York City, at least I know there is a New York City. So this question is based on a fallacy. Uh, the Quran does have some truths because it does refer to some biblical topics. So in answer, uh, of course the virgin birth is true. Um, but that has nothing to do with the issue of the attempt to think that because you say the, the youths in the cave 309 years is a farce, is a fable, that that means all of it is. No, no. A lot of that can be true, some false, but that's definite. It is not the Word of God. It is a false book. Muhammad, it's his work. His fingerprints are all over it. The dialect, the stories. I see no reason to even attempt, and I will answer that other question, as Jamil Badawi in his tape, in the question, did Allah ever speak directly? Did God ever talk directly to Muhammad? No. But God talked directly to Moshe and to Abraham and to the apostles. So who this Jabril is, probably an Time angel is up. Thank him. you very much, Thank Dr. Murray. And please uh, stand close by. It's a question for Shabir Ali. Muslims claim the Quran is a miracle. What is so miraculous about this book? Hmm. There are many miraculous features about the Quran. But first, I'd like to thank you as an audience that you would notice when I go off topic, but you don't notice when Dr. Mori goes off topic. I'd like you to notice it now, but also be quiet about it. Dr. Mori just misquoted Dr. Jamal Badawi, just as he's been misquoting everything else. I also heard the tapes of Dr. Jamal Badawi. Dr. Badawi quoted from the Quran about the three ways in which God speaks to human beings. And Dr. Badawi concluded that God spoke to Muhammad in all of three ways, including speaking to him directly on the night of the ascension. These are the words of Dr. Badawi, not what Dr. Mori has just reported, unfortunately. Now, the miraculous features of the Quran. The Quran is worded in such a way that you find that linguistically it is a miracle. Dr. Mori has seen a fault in the Quran that sometimes according to him and to some scholars the grammar does not seem right. But even here it di displays a miraculous feature of the Quran. The Quran says if two groups of Muslims are fighting with each other then you should separate them. If two groups of Muslims are fighting, it says iktatalu, they are fighting. But here the term is plural, requiring not just two as in English, but in Arabic you'd require three or more. So why does it say iktatalu, that they are fighting with each other as if there are many? I am describing the miraculous features of the Quran, please, please. Now, here the reason is, obviously, that when two groups of Muslims are separate, they are two groups. Make peace between the two of them, the two groups. But if they're fighting, they're iktatalu, it's all of them rambling in it with each other. That's plural. So here, the change in grammar displays a remarkable feature of the Quran, which Muhammad on whom be peace would not have thought about. And I can show you examples like this one after another, if we have time. Furthermore, the Quran... Time is up, Mr. Ali. Thank, thank you, you very much. We have two more. Huh? <laughs> Let us keep this down, please. Now, Dr. Mori, the question is, no side discussions, please. We're here to hear the speakers. If North America is like Saudi Arabia, then the government will not have a corrupted country as we have now. Well, I'm not a politician, but, you know, my wife would like to drive a car. I think she would like to vote. I, I cannot think of any greater corruption uh, as in Saudi Arabia. Women cannot drive cars. They're not allowed to vote. Filipino maids, other maids are raped at will and kept as slaves. Uh, you have no freedom of religion. No church is allowed. Um, the religious pre priests, uh, the police go along uh, spraying women. If you don't have the proper headgear, they go up on the roof smashing uh, satellite antennas. No freedom of press, no freedom of religion, no freedom of assembly, no... Well, I would put it this way. Uh, Saudi Arabia is a nice prison. Um, 
the inmates, uh, there's a lot of death. People get their heads cut off. Um, I wouldn't like to live there. I would rather at least have the freedom to believe and the freedom to go and to buy books and put up with the few muggers and the few rapists on the street instead of have the rapist and the muggers running the government mugging me. Thank you, Dr. Murray. Now, Mr. Ali, would you please step up? Well, the question is, do you think that if you disapprove the Bible and Christianity, this means that the Quran and Islam are true? Hmm. Absolutely not. As Dr. Mori has rightly pointed out, disproving one thing does not prove that the other thing is true. But I've demonstrated tonight that those who try to disprove the Quran, they should apply the same methods to the Bible if they say they believe in the Bible. But it's inconsistent to say that we're going to disprove the Quran using a certain method, but, you know, when it comes to the Bible, we forget about that method and pretend everything is okay. No, the Quran stands or falls on its own two feet. And the Quran proves itself again and again to be true, regardless what may be happening in Saudi Arabia or any other country, regardless how bad Muslims may be. Islam reveals its, itself in the Quran to be absolutely the truth. The same true God that was spoken of again and again in the Quran, in the Bible, that Quran tells us the same God is the truth. All of the contradictions and errors that have occurred in the Quran, the, in, the, in the Bible rather, the Quran has carefully avoided. Earlier at the start of the, I can make a mistake, but the Quran doesn't make any and Muhammad made none when he was reciting the Quran. That's important. Earlier on, to start this program, somebody re recited from Hebrews chapter 1. Did you know that that Hebrews chapter 1, where it says that the God said to the angels, worship the Son. Do you know that Paul misquoted Deuteronomy? If you go to Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 6, where this is supposed to be quoted from, you see that Paul quoted not from the Hebrew version, which is the original, but an inaccurate Septuagint version, and then Paul also misquoted that Septuagint because it does not say worship the Son, but it says worship Jehovah. So Paul made a double mistake there. But you find no such thing in the Quran. Again and again you see that if you subject the Quran to a wise scrutiny, you must conclude that Muhammad on whom be peace could not have authored Time this book, but Thank it was you, Mr. Ali. by God Almighty. Thank you. Now the question to Dr. Murray. The question is, if the Quran is full of stories and fairy tales, why is it similar to the Bible, and why do you believe in such stories and fairy tales like a religion if they are, if they are so unreal? Um, the question is somewhat coherent, uh, incoherent. I'm not sure exactly. I mean, um, I believe the Quran is full of stories and fairy tales. It came from Arabian Nights and stuff like that. Why is it similar to the Bible? I would assume that they mean by similar, sounds like, feels like, something like that. Like the Book of Mormon is similar. Other books that are written to sort of try to ape the Bible. But it's not similar at all. The Bible is one. It's not one book. It's 66 books. The Quran is one book, one author. The Bible is over 40 different authors, over 2,000 years, versus 22 years. There's no comparison. The Bible is an encyclopedia. The Quran is 114 surahs arranged according to size, irrespective of when they were delivered. So it's a, a convoluted... A disconnected, distorted thing. I don't find the Bible begins Brashit bara alhim hashemaim. It starts with Brashit. It begins with the beginning and ends with the end. In the Quran, you begin. Well, as I said, it's all mixed up because you, the longer surahs and the shorter ones. So it's, some people say you begin at the end and you end at the beginning. So I don't find it similar at all. Um, I don't find any of the fairy tales in the Bible. I don't find the youths in caves and stuff like that. So I, I don't find any comparison at all. But again, see, I think the logical problem is they're assuming, again, this argument. Well, okay, even if I admit it, what, the Bible isn't true either. <laughs> so if the Bible isn't true, <laughs> and it's a false book, and you accept it, then I can have the Quran, and it's a false book too. No, if the Quran is a false book, fine. If the Bible is a false book, Fine, I can live with that. But I'm telling you, the debate had to do, 
and the lectures had to do this week with the Quran, not the Bible. I hope someone will bring me, and I'll, I'm glad to lecture on the Bible. But the view of inspiration is different from that of the Muslim concept. Of Time is up. Thank you very much, Thank Dr. Mori. <laughs> Mr. Ali? The question is, is Muhammad, if Muhammad could proclaim that his followers could worship the three daughters of Moon, could he not have allowed the same Allah God that, his, that for his fathers and Quran worshipped? Uh, can I look at it? The question says, if Muhammad could proclaim that his followers could worship the three daughters of the moon, could he not have allowed the same Allah God and that, should he not allow, have allowed the same Allah God that his fathers and uh, Quraysh uh, worship? See, this question betrays the kind of impression that Dr. Mori leaves on his audiences. He gives the impression that in Islam, you can worship the three daughters of Allah, that Muhammad told people they can worship the three daughters of Allah. Whereas, in fact, there is a fallacy of equivocation here, where Mori finds that there is what is called the daughters of, of the moon god in some inscription. And then he said the pagan Arabs in Mecca had three gods which they call the daughters of Allah, so then he's making them the same. But that's equivocation, they're not the same. We're not we're dealing with two separate areas and two separate issues. Furthermore, the Quran specifically says that you cannot worship these which the people were calling the daughters of Allah. That you should worship Allah alone and he has no sons, he has no daughters. The Quran makes that clear. But Dr. Mori trades on this kind of confusion. And since Dr. Mori has rightly pointed out that we're not debating the Bible here, we're debating the Quran, and since he has carefully evaded my challenge, I'll make him a new challenge. I will challenge him to debate the question of the authority and authenticity of the Bible in Pennsylvania. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Excuse me, let us order. Now the question to Dr. Mori. The question is, who are the Muslim Arab scholars that you mentioned who gave you such information, i.e. paradise? Well, um, as I said, you need to go and get the book 99 Names for God, Judith Miller, New York Times Correspondence, Head of the Middle East Department. She will give you some documentation. I have a couple other books. You'll find any of your basic textbooks, if you look under the term paradise, and Muslim theology. I think I have a quote from Ali Ghazali. I mean, you can't get any higher Ghazali and others. It'll give you a description from the Quran. Uh, I don't drag everything with me. Um, but the biblical concept of heaven is in stark contrast to the Muslim concept of paradise. Heaven is a place of holiness. Paradise is a place of wickedness. Heaven is viewed as a place where we are at last perfected in sanctification, where there will be no marriage and no giving in marriage, hence no sex. Women will not be oppressed. There will be no horries waiting for us, no use to commit sodomy with. So uh, when you look at the contrast, um, there's no question in my mind that Allah's paradise has nothing to do with the heaven that is mentioned in Scripture as the place where Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father, uh, so that it cannot be the same God since it's not the same ultimate destination. They're going to a paradise, I'm going to heaven, and never the twain shall meet. Thank you, Dr. Murray. <laughs> now we come to last question each. This is the last question for Mr. Ali, and there shall be the last question for Dr. Mori. And then I'll give the instruction as we go along. Thank you. The Muslims refer to Muhammad as a holy prophet. Now Muhammad broke all commandments previously given by Jehovah God of Adam, Noah, Abraham, and Moses. He broke all stanzas of humanity. For example, he killed thousands of people with his own hands. He instituted polygamy. He even married to a 10-year-old girl. How can a man with these characters be called a holy prophet? Just as uh, Moses and Joshua and other prophets too in the Bible, 
can be called holy prophets of God, messengers of God. Uh, they did some of the things which some of you people would be surprised to hear about if I were to describe them now from the Bible. For example, what would you say to the fact that God approved that Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines? For example, David is called a man after God's own heart. But do you know that when David, when, when David, order uh, please, listen please, when David in the Bible became old, a young virgin was sought out and brought to keep his body warm. And this man is called a man after God's own heart. L ladies and gentlemen, I did not come here today to attack you or to attack Christianity or the Bible. And if it sounded that way, I would like to apologize sincerely to every Christian here. But I'm just responding to the questions and the statements that are being made. Then and let finally, us stick to the questions, please, and I would ask the audience to really exercise self-restraint. Thank you. Finally, I should say that the Prophet Muhammad, on whom be peace, was a man who displayed in every way that he had the best character and most suited for a prophet. The Prophet, peace be upon him, was never accused by any of his enemies even as being untrustworthy. In fact, they called him Al-Amin and As-Sadiq, which means the truthful and the trustworthy one. The Prophet Muhammad, on whom be peace, had concern even for the animals. Once when he was traveling, according to William Montgomery Watt, the Prophet Muhammad, on whom be peace, directed his uh, men to stand guard to make sure that a female dog that was given birth should be properly taken care of and that that dog should not be harmed by anyone. And Montgomery Watt found it amazing that a man living in that circumstance, in that geographical location, and in that time and space, that that man should have had such concern for animals. The Prophet Muhammad, on whom be peace, needs to be studied. He needs to be understood. And I thank you very much, ladies thank and gentlemen. Thank you, Dr. Mr. Ali. Now, last question for Dr. Murray. Yeah, now there was one about the Hadith. It was there. Mm. The question is, I'm having a little difficulty sometimes either reading the question or sometimes some of the questions are rather incoherent. But the question is, did God use his people to punish other people after? I don't have too many questions for you, so I'm sorry I have to give you this one. Um, I'm going to take a stab. In the Old Testament under the Old Covenant, which was a theocracy, where God ruled as king, and his kingdom had borders. You'd have to have a passport. There was an army, and they went to war. You had an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. When Jesus came, he fulfilled the prophecy that a new covenant would be given. The church does not have any geographical limitations. It is not an earthly kingdom. The church does not have an army. As, as a pastor, I don't take out a rubber hose and beat someone up because they didn't attend. Hence, under the New Testament, New Covenant rules, Jesus told Peter, put the sword away. My gospel is, is not to be something you, you do by running around threatening people. Whereas, as I can read in the book of the man who wrote against me, he said, Muhammad, and I'm quoting the Muslim writer, Muhammad gave the people a choice, accept Islam or die. So I'm thinking here, this person may be assuming that in the Old Testament, when you had a theocracy, an earthly kingdom with an earthly king and God reigning, and they had armies and they had fights with the Assyrians, uh, that somehow this excuses today in the 20th century blowing up the World Trade Center, uh, shooting down an airline of people over Lockerbie in Scotland, or blowing up that apartment house in India, or the recent blowing up of that uh, army facility in Saudi Arabia, I would say, no, th there is no theocracy now. God's kingdom is to be one of his reign in the heart through the Lord Jesus Christ. And I do bear my testimony that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God. I do thank you for listening tonight. I do thank uh, the Muslim friends for being kind enough to hear another side. I have attended lectures where I've patiently heard things about my God and my Jesus and my Bible, and I didn't flip out. And I want to thank you for not flipping out. This uh, helps me. Uh, while some people can be hostile and use ad hominem and just be picky, 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 instead, 
I think it's helpful the issues be resolved. The pre-Islamic origins of the Quran and, and Islam have been demonstrated, and I believe the concept of Allah, as revealed in the Quran, is not a valid concept of God. Thank you very much. beautiful closing statement, I thought it would be appropriate too to ask the moderators to give me a like opportunity. Ladies and gentlemen, finally again I must apologize one more time. I know I have said certain things here tonight, which although they are true, they would hurt many people. And ladies and gentlemen, it is not my intention to hurt anyone. It is just that the circumstances and the type of debate we were doing tonight, as I've said, was normal, not a normal debate. And so we had to deal with it in a way that is not my style. I did not like it. And from the very inception when we started our negotiations for this debate, I made it quite clear to Mr. Coker that this is not my style. But I'm going along with it because I really wanted the opportunity to meet Mr. Mori in a debate. Several times the topic was changed on me. Several times the arrangement was changed. Uh, Mr. Coker is, uh, can bear evidence to this, and uh, at least I have the written documents to prove it. Our correspondence is there. Uh, what uh, was proposed fair at one time was no longer considered fair anymore. And so in all of these this difficult circumstances, and with, with many butterflies in my chest, I stood here before you tonight and tried the best I could to defend the truth of God. So finally, I'd like to thank you very much for your patient listening. I know some of the time you didn't behave yourself as well, and I said I didn't like that. I apologize to you, and I hope that you will also forgive me. And I hope that this will be a starting point from which we can start to learn more about the issues that were being addressed here uh, tonight. And for this, I thank you very much. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I think we, our evening comes to a conclusion, and we will all agree uh, tonight that it was a great evening which marked a new era, era or marked a new history in the history of Toronto, Please that we people can get together, discuss things which may be very annoying to each one, each one of us in a very brotherly and a very nice manner. And I think we demonstrated it all tonight that we can, we can do it. If we did it now, we can do it again. At the same time, I would like to extend my thanks to each one of you who attended this evening, even though being a Sunday night and being a very long night. We all sticked around and we really listened and we really were good and we really gave respect to the speakers. As on the note, I will also extend my hearty thanks to Dr. Moray, who extended our invitation to come to Toronto and later on extended our invitation to debate uh, uh, Brother Shibir Ali. And I, at the same time, I like to extend a great amount of thanks for, to Shabir Ali, who happens to be a fine man, and uh, he compromised with us all along. Uh, he, uh, he, even though, as he said very truly, that he did not want to debate, he said very truly that he didn't like the style, but uh, he came along, and we appreciate that, and we can't deny that, that he has done a fine job this evening. Brother Shabir Ali, we are very thankful for that. <coughs> Well, as far as your allegation regarding the topics being changed and uh, rules being changed, uh, well, we are ending up this evening in a very pleasant way, so we really don't want to go into it and start up another argument. But as you said very well, that if some errors were made on your part, you apologize, and at the same note, we say that if any errors were made on our part, as organizers, we please accept our heartfelt apologies on that. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have been talking extensively to uh, Brother uh, Shabir Ali, and uh, there were four topics suggested initially by Dr. Moray, out of which we came to the conclusion that we can have two. But maybe later on, we can have a series of debates. We can have a series of topics where we can discuss one topic at a time in a more detailed manner. But all I could conclude that that was a very pleasant evening, and I think that will leave a very memorable mark on our memories. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Now, before you leave, please, uh, we would like to leave on a very positive note. We worked out the last-minute protocol 
with both sides. So our uh, Mr. Ali will uh, give the closing prayers for the Muslim side with the respect from the Christian side. And right after that, Father Mankarios will give the closing prayers for the Christian side with the respect from the Muslim side, then we can all leave very quietly and pleasantly. Thank you. Now I ask Mr. Molly to please come to the podium to give the closing prayers for two minutes, that is maximum. I would ask all members to please remain seated. Excuse me. Please remain seated for the closing prayers on both sides. It just shows respect. Mr. Ari, would you please come forward to the podium? God Almighty, maker of the heavens and the earth, I notice here in the Bible, God, that the early Christians prayed to you, calling you Sovereign Lord. And they said, you made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. And they referred to Jesus as your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed. God, as the earliest and the true Christians did pray to you, I also pray to you tonight. I address you, God Almighty, the God of Abraham, Isaac, Moses, and Jacob. God, that you bless everyone here with the light of guidance. God Almighty, some of us have said things tonight that we shouldn't have said. I ask you, God, to forgive us tonight. God Almighty, some of us have behaved in a manner that perhaps we should not have behaved. And I ask you for your forgiveness tonight. God Almighty, clearly some of us are in need of guidance. And I ask you, God, to grant us that guidance. Guide every soul to understand that you are the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you sent is your anointed one. God Almighty, I ask you to accept from us this humble prayer. Forgive us always from our sins. Guide us on the right path. God, if there was anything said here tonight which is actually true, we ask you, God, to open up our chests for that message. Let the light of that truth shine into our hearts. And I ask you, God, if there was anything said here tonight which is false, God, I ask you to save us from the errors that we speak and we hear. And I ask you, God, to direct us away from the path that will take us into the hellfire and take us on the path of paradise, the paradise that you have created for your righteous servants. Amen. Would Father Macarius please come? One God, Amen. We thank you, God, for your gifts, for what we learned this evening and the evenings before. We ask you to bless us all, to give liberty, freedom, and worship your name, your holy name. You, my, our dear God, our beloved God, you learn us to love each other. We enter Ismuk al Kuddus fi kulli makan. Niyarif al Alam kullu. Annaka sulibta ala salib. You was crucified on the cross. Gaita li tukhallis al Alam kullu. سفكت دمك الطاهر على خشبة الصليب كنت قويا كنت عظيما كنت جليلا في عطائك في سخائك 
وأنت على الصليب كنت أقوى من أي إنسان ومن أي شخص ومن أي قوة في العالم أعطيتنا الخلاص أعطيتنا الرجاء وأنت ابن الله والروح القدوس الطاهر يحل بيننا يعلمنا المحبة يعلمنا السلام أيها الثالوث القدوس كن معنا أيها الثالوث القدوس باركنا وارض علينا وسامحنا واغفر لنا خطايانا وذنوبنا ووحد قلوبنا وحل بيننا وباركنا جميعا لك المجد والعظم والسلطان إلى الأبد أمين واجعلنا مستحقين أن نصلي بشكر أور فازر هو آرت إن هيفن السماء قد سيسمي يأتي ملكوت لكل مشيئة كما في السماء كذلك دين اليوم Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil in Christ Jesus our Lord and the glory forever and ever Amen Thank you very much Thank you very much